Hello everyone, welcome back to Ask a Scientist Gaming, where we combine mediocre gameplay with expert level science. At least that's what we usually do. Tonight we have something special going on. We're combining mediocre gameplay with uh, graduate admissions advice and stories and Q&A. Um, so I'm Ken Hansen, Associate Professor in Chemistry and Biochemistry. I usually do photochemistry, photophysics, uh, light-driven molecular processes, but today I'm here as a representative of uh, the FSU Chemistry Department Admissions Committee. Also joining me today is Justin Kenimer. Justin, if you wouldn't mind introducing yourself. Yeah. Hello, everybody. Justin Kenimer, Associate Professor in the Department of Chemistry and Biochemistry uh, down here in Tallahassee, Florida at Florida State University. Um, my area of research, um, what I'm very passionate about is polymer synthesis, organic materials, um, structure property relationships of, of, of polymers and, and their uh, very interesting self-assembly capabilities. Uh, in a nutshell. Yeah. And I am the chair of the GRAC committee and, and happy to have Ken Hansen as a as a part of this committee and happy to be here. All right. Equally important. What are we starting with? We are starting with a game that I'd almost forgotten about. And then I was just thinking for a while about video games. And I was wondering about one that I hadn't played in forever that was pretty fun called Carmageddon 2. Uh, this is just a great way to waste time and unwind at the end of a long graduate uh, student uh, day uh, and uh, just drive around and wreak havoc on a city. So this was when you were in grad school, you played this? No, no. I played this in, in, as an undergraduate okay. at Radford University. I was going to say, this is yeah. what, 99? This is, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 All right. Let's so, do it. Let's kick off some gameplay. All right. Let me see if I can just load it up here. All right. <laughs> so there's the different levels of difficulty, as easy as stamping on kittens. <laughs> That's what we want. That's what we want, at least for now. <laughs> All right. So <laughs> let's do this. You want to explain what this game is before we develop that yeah, in the Q&A? I feel like this game sort of, I don't remember when Grand Theft Auto kind of started, but this game sort of introduced the concept of just driving around in a demolition derby style method and uh, doing as much havoc as humanly possible on the uh, town. And, and you'll see that it's, it, it's quite uh, graphic. Uh, there's a dog, oops. And then, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, you get bonus points for hitting things. Pretty much anything that you hit is a bonus point. So uh, it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's fun. It's a, just a fun way to unrind if you don't take it too seriously. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, the graphics don't feel as realistic as they once were. So. No, but what you want to do is wreck these other cars like this, right? So you just want to jam them up and, and break them. Uh, that's how you win. So we're doing pretty good so far. <laughs> that's awesome. All right, well, Justin warms up. I, I thought I'd just give a, a quick, I don't know, overview. So anyone that's interested in grad school, particularly in chemistry and biochemistry, um, and this timeline is generally holds true across most universities, but in the fall of your senior year of undergrad or your year before actually starting grad school, you'll apply to a graduate program. So you submit application materials like your CV, your GPA, transcripts, uh, cover letter. Uh, you'll get three letters of recommendation. You'll submit them through some kind of online portal, and then you basically wait. Then what happens on our end is we compile all those applications. We have a committee of five or six individuals that basically go through all the applications, and we decide, you know, this person's above our bar, this person we should admit. And then ultimately in, we'll say, January, February, March, you start getting acceptance letters, or now they're emails. And so it basically says, uh, we'd love to have you part of the program. Here's the information. Um, you're officially a Admitted to the program or you're we're giving you an official offer and then basically it's all on you to decide where you want to go so you get several offers and then usually in the spring they do visitation weekends which is basically uh, particularly in chemistry we pay for you to fly out well, that one's already dead <laughs> yeah. pay for you to fly out visit the university get a feel for what's going on and then by April 15th you basically need to make a decision and so you'll formally accept an offer somewhere, and then in the fall of the next year, typically early August, you are gonna officially join a program. And so that's, that's basically the timeline of admissions, and then once you're in a program, it's basically classes the first year. After you're done with classes, then it is nothing but research, plus you have to do some presentations along the way, and ultimately defend your thesis in somewhere about, at FSU 5.2 years, you're a PhD, and so that's, kind of the universal timeline. Right, 
Anything to add to that? Did I miss anything? Well, I think that that was a, a pretty good nutshell. A lot happens in between all that, but... Uh, <laughs> but Yeah, grad school <laughs> happens in between. Yeah, yeah, major, major points there, but uh, yeah, I, yeah. Think you, I think you nailed it. All the highs and lows in between, yeah. But we loved it. That's why we do what we do is because we enjoyed that journey. Oh, yeah. All right, before we open up to questions, we have I have an important question for you. What are we drinking tonight? Uh, for me... We are drinking a, uh, a, a homegrown favorite uh, here, local proof brewery in Tallahassee. Uh, so this would be 850, sort of their flagship uh, flagship beer. 850 is the area code in Tallahassee for those of you that are not uh, here in Tallahassee. And so uh, really good beer, just a great um, hanging out on a Wednesday night, running over dogs. Beer. <laughs> That's perfect. <laughs> All right. If anyone has questions, feel free to throw them in chat at any time. And Bells Express, welcome. Yeah, tonight we're doing a Q&A regarding uh, graduate admissions, graduate school. If you have any insights, feel free to throw them out there. Bronco, welcome back to the stream. Oh, outside of just working more hours per week, how can you finish a PhD early? I mean, it's it's... There's no guaranteed recipe for success on doing that. Um, I would I would say this: uh, the the ones that, that buy into the commitment level of grad school, you know, kind of early, that that really try hard to um, not dilly dally and start getting right in there, and without apprehension, just start putting glassware in clamps, start mixing things together. Well, depending on your research, right? You might not be doing that, but you know, those that, you know, without apprehension, just dig in uh, and, and work hard, you, you tend to have an activation energy, if you will, uh, with grad school. And if you can overcome that activation energy barrier, uh, I think that you'll find that a lot of things start to, uh, um, uh, I guess, the, the train leaves the station. Would that be a good way of putting it? <laughs> yeah, momentum, see. right? You get this momentum going, and then suddenly you're having all this fun publishing, going to conferences, uh, writing papers, uh, really enjoying the fruits of your efforts and labor. Um, and if, if you really do, uh, you know, do it early enough and get quite a, quite a body of work, um, you know, there's a chance of, of beating the clock, I guess you could say. And it really depends on your discipline too. Like a biochemist is typically going to take longer than a materials chemist. And that's just because of the nature of the research, right? If you have to deal with cell lines, you're going to have to wait for a lot of things. I mean, there's there's certain inherent limitations depending on what research you do. But one thing I, I will do is, is flip that statement around and not necessarily, I recommend you don't look at grad school as some sort of timeline, but instead as an experiential development process. And so I had a discussion with my graduate advisor, like, when do you think it's time for me to, ready to, to be ready to go? And he was like, when you basically stopped learning things, <laughs> like when you've, and that's not, I, I'm always learning new things, but it was more of a, when you've developmentally surpassed your circumstance and you need to move on to another research project. And so I, I, I would look at grad school as not a means to an end, but an experience that helps you develop as a researcher. And if you make the most out of that, uh, it's gonna be awesome experience. Yeah. And, you know, there, I guess there is some benefit to like finishing as fast as possible, but at the same time, there's no other time in your life where your, your, your work is just kind of pure science and not like other things kind of invading the, uh, the, the pure science aspect of it. Right. Um, so yeah, like I, you don't have to swim in the bureaucracy and the paperwork as much and, like the, the funding and there's a lot of freedom in grad school. Yeah. I mean, your advisor gives you like a $1 million laboratory and a hood and says, hey, have fun, you know, learn some stuff. And and, and that's really what we want is just for graduate students to dig in and, and just buy into the process and enjoy science. Yeah. And learn and develop as much as you can. Like, there's a threshold like three or four years in when you're no longer a student or a colleague. That's awesome. <laughs> like, yep. tell me I'm wrong. <laughs> tell me why I'm wrong. Oh. <laughs> Oof. <laughs> that was that's, cut in half. <laughs> corners of buildings. Are you done? Because that's you're, you're officially grad. Oh, man. I guess you don't want to rip your car in half. 
All I right. thought we had lives. Let's go to a different level. All right. Rocky 2. <laughs> oh, this one looks harder. All right. The Dish 4 wants to know what happens if you don't get into a program? Um. So, I mean. I, I would say that it's not highly common that you don't get into any programs. Um, I, I, I honestly don't know because I only had one experience going through the process, but, uh, you know, there's, there's, there's a variety of, 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 of schools, I think, out there that, that you can apply to. Um, oh, I'm stuck. R, yeah. There we go. Uh, you know, there's like the, the upper echelon top tier schools, which like a lot of people, you know, don't get into. It's just the way it is. And then uh, there's a lot of quality schools um, after that. Uh, and, um, you know, there, there might be some, some, some safer schools. But I, I always tell students that, you know, 80 degrees Celsius is 80 degrees Celsius in every laboratory in the country. Right, it's not like a reaction happens differently at MIT than it does uh, at, at at some other university. And so, you know, I think you can you can find an opportunity uh, if you spread around your applications enough um, and, and really dig in. And um, you'll you'll have the ability, at, you know, to do good science and, and fun science anywhere. So I, I would, I guess, recommend. Recognizing the question, I would I would recommend casting a wider net if you're worried about that. I don't know if maybe you're worried about your GPA, um, uh, but if that's the case, you know you know you can apply to some safer schools, as, as we would call it, that might that might be willing to take a lower GPA um, and take a, a chance on someone like you, right? So that would, I guess that's the best advice I can give to that. Yeah, and I give similar advice to my students that are applying. Um, so there's different tiers of schools, right? And so you can have schools that you think you're safe or safety schools. They're, they're going to have typically lower GPA status or application thresholds. And they'll actually typically say, say those on the website, like ours is a 3.1 GPA. And it used to have a GRE score, but we're not applying GREs this year. But you can go through those and you can apply for the MITs of the world or the FSUs or, you know, you can go down the list and get a distribution of, I don't know, tiers of schools. So at least hopefully you'll get at least one of them. Uh, if you don't, sometimes you can get feedback on why you might not have been accepted. I mean, that's not always the case, but if you reach out to somebody in the admissions program, they'll say, you know, your GPA was too low. Uh, hopefully there are things that you can address. Maybe it's additional research experience or changing, I don't know, something in your application to give it another shot the year after. So that's one thing you can do. Uh, Prince Bedotet, <laughs> thank you for the follow. Uh, thank you for joining us at Ask a Scientist Gaming. All right, yeah. come, oh, go ahead. Me and this guy are going at it, by the way. Mr. Orange right here. <laughs> this is serious business, Carmageddon and admissions discussion. Bells Express Ooh. says they dropped out of school so they could attend the stream. Anyway, what's the topic of this stream again? <laughs> <laughs> it's Carmageddon. <laughs> That's all it's about. <laughs> uh, it's amazing. All right, Calm Down Bronco wants to know, aside from independence, what are the big differences between a PhD and a postdoc? Independence is a big one, so he, he, you're right on with their calm, calm down, Bronco. With 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 understanding that, I mean, a postdoc. I think I think you know. I, I said about graduate school being a really fun time. I, I would say the the postdoc is the only thing that I that I experienced in life that trumped pure like is from a pure science perspective. I mean, your job is literally to just apply all the knowledge you gained in grad school, or uh, and to towards towards research. Um, the money's different. <laughs> Let's start there. Uh, you know, the way that it works sort of from grad school to postdoc to maybe professorship is that you sort of double your income each time. Uh, so you're maybe in the, the you know, the mid twenties in grad school to maybe fifty to sixty thousand as a postdoc and then uh, um, near th uh, six digits now as a as a professor, right? So um, there's that, and you know, the postdoc is, I think, a really good opportunity to uproot from, you know, your graduate school experience, move to a cool new area that you might not live in uh, uh, in the future, just a place that you've 
maybe you wanted to a climate or a place that maybe you wanted to go and experience and then uh, just have fun with it. Keep meeting, keep expanding your social network and uh, um, yeah. So I'll follow up on one big difference, uh, postdoc versus grad school. So in terms of pure science, I agree with Justin on everything. Um, in, in terms of like personal non-science life, it is a very different experience. Like grad school, you come in with a cohort of basically built-in friends and social network, right? The grad students that are starting at the exact same time as you. Uh, postdoc is a little different. If you're in a group where you're the only postdoc, you are that singular person. And you can be friends with the grad students, but it's not quite the same as taking classes together, finding a group together. Yeah. If you're in a group with several postdocs, which is my postdoc experience, it's, it's kind of like grad school. Um, but yeah, there's the other thing to note is that like when you're starting as a postdoc, you're very different social and professional position than grad students, right? Like you're uh, a lot of people are having kids by the time they're postdocs, right? And so their their social life is going to be very very different, and so that's something else to consider. I don't think it changes your experience because you can have social circles outside a lab, um, but it's just something to be aware of. It can be a lonely time. It it can be isolating if you don't have that social network. All right. Found the checkpoint. <laughs> you got you accidentally got a checkpoint. Yeah, I think. Uh, I, I don't know if you mentioned this, but everyone, there are two ways to beat this game or win a race. One is to actually win the race. The other one is to destroy the five other cars. Which I try to do. <laughs> <laughs> All yeah. right. Ecowa one three six wants to know what makes a good purpose statement, reason statement, etc. On applications. That's a great question. That is um, a great question. I, yeah, I've seen a variety of them. Um, sometimes it's ones that I've never really even thought of or read before that kind of stand out. Um, you, you can, you can certainly what I would like to call vanilla this, the the purpose statement where you just kind of hit kind of a lot of the common phrases of uh, uh, of of other letters, if you will. So, for example, that. Uh, that you like science, okay, we hope you do, you know, you're applying to grad school, we hope that you like science. Uh, um, but I think the ones that resonate a little bit are the ones that kind of come through with a lot of honesty and a lot of, um, a lot of personal story, if you will, as to kind of what brought you to the decision that you wanted to dedicate, you know, a half a decade of your life and, you know, a lot of hours and, and, and some up days and some down days uh, to the pursuit of uh, the unknown in, in science. And um, oh, I got the repulsifier. And so, yeah, I would just say try to try to be honest um, and 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 don't uh, you know don't try to make up stories just to make it sound like it's better. I, I would I would say that maybe there's a level of genuineness that can kind of be determined. Um, but um, that would be my advice. And also, here's another one. If you did research as an undergrad, and I, and I highly recommend that you do, if you're, if you're going to go to grad school, really put a, little, put, put a paragraph in that personal statement about the research that you did. Um, put, put um, you know, as if you were to explain it, like at a conference or something like that. Right? Really talk about the research that you did to a level where it's clear to the reader that you put a lot of thought into the project, that you understand what the goals of your project was. Uh, you can you can highlight some of the successes that you had, some of the great days that that you had as far as some discoveries, and even you know you can highlight some of the triumphs or the things that you overcame uh, as a part of research. So definitely highlight your research experiences because that's what we're ultimately looking for is is people that are interested in research yeah that is one of the like only writing genuine writing samples we get from a graduate student is that statement right like any papers you publish it's going to be assumed that a grad student pi postdoc wrote that and you were just a tourist on it whether that was true or not that's going to be the assumption but your personal statement is largely going to be assumed to be written by you and so that writing sample is going to be foreshadowing to what it'd be like to write a paper with you. And so, yeah, I totally agree with that. With that said, there's, there's another part of this. Um, so 
when people are reviewing applications, it is reviewed by individuals that have their own priorities, their own choices. Some think the CV is most important. Some might care about GPA. Some might care about research experience. It's going to be a little bit all over the place. And so for me, I don't necessarily look at the personal statement uh, except to either clarify some red flag in the application or maybe find out you know, if there are any red flags or something I should know about. So what I mean by that is you might have had a really bad semester and it might have dropped your GPA like 0.5 points. It is entirely okay to write that in your, in your cover letter, in your personal statement. But you can also frame that as, I had a really bad semester, but you'll notice I got better and here's what I did to get better. And so it's your yeah. opportunity to yeah. reframe something that was a problem into something that was positive. You get I the won. win. You I finished won. the race. Yeah, I finished. What? <laughs> Hand brakes. You, you can finish races. That's amazing. <laughs> no, that's a really good point, Ken. I mean, I think that a lot of people have personal stories within the weak spots of their application, and you know, sometimes it's not about finding the student that's just got the 4.0 GPA and the highest metrics imaginable. It's about finding the student that's got the grit, right? Mm -hmm. Cause, cause graduate school is a grind. We want, you know, we want scrappers to come in and overcome adversity. And, and so your GPA suffered because of a semester where you had to overcome a lot. Well, mm -hmm. tell us about it. You know, tell us about that semester. Tell us about how you rebounded and, and how you're ready to step into the, into the stage now and come into grad school and, and, uh, and, and replace that moniker of, of the GPA or whatever, you know, which is just a metric, replace that with a new opinion of your capabilities, right? Yeah, I don't think you can afford cars yet, but for everyone interested, you can collect enough credits to buy these yeah. different cars. So you can do the little go kart looking thing or the, but I don't know how expensive they are. Oh, well, the, you have to waste them. You, yeah, you can't buy them unless you destroy them. Oh, I thought I at least, I thought I, I thought I killed orange here. This guy was burning me. All right. Well, anyway, <laughs> it's time to do it again. All right. So we're going to go right. ahead. Yeah, let's keep going. Um, Bronco had a quick one. How big a difference is there between applying early to the program versus right before the deadline? In terms of your likelihood of getting accepted, I'm going to say zero. Yeah, zero. Um, applying first thing just means your application's going to sit around for a little while before um, we get enough applications to really start grinding through them all and get into the process. Of course, you don't want to wait to the last minute, but if your application did come in before the deadline that we set, you know, we set a deadline for a reason. Um, if it comes in four minutes before that deadline, it's technically in before the deadline. We don't look at it any any differently than the way that it was uh, originally um, supposed to be intended. But after the deadline, it significantly reduces your likelihood of being accepted the program. Right, because we have to we have to move forward. We have to make decisions. Um, there's a time limit to everything, unfortunately. Uh, and Christmas is usually on its way, and, and you know we're trying to get the semester wrapped up. So we have that uh, December fifteenth deadline uh, for that purpose, uh, preferred deadline. Um, and I would try to recommend uh, getting it in before the preferred deadline. Yeah, yeah, like uh, right after December fifteenth or even early December, we'll start looking at applications and make decisions. So some people will get admittance offers from FSU in December. That'll be t domestic students. If you're international, it's a later timeline. It's just because more time to process. I just got something called ethereal pedestrians. Do you remember what that is? I have no idea what that is. <laughs> and of course, I don't see a single pedestrian. Maybe that's it. Maybe they all vanished into the ether. <laughs> this was the left behind moment. The left behind power up. <laughs> all right. Using the turbo. Yeah, and those of you that are seeing chat right now, uh, Lorianne 22 is our graduate advisor, so she knows what she's talking about. In fact, she knows it better than Justin and I do. So yeah. she is on the practical side of this, where she actually processes the applications and puts them in a folder, and then we get to see them. So, Lori, thank you for joining us. We appreciate you being around and appreciate for helping us in this process because we'd be lost without you. So, yeah. <laughs> Hi, Lori. Miss you. <laughs> uh, that's fair. Um, do, 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 do. We should probably do a prediction. Which one do you Ooh. want to do? Ooh. 
addiction. Um, do I, is, there, is there a list of them? Yep. Let's do the second one down. This one? Yeah. <laughs> That's a good one. All right, so those of you not familiar, Twitch has this really nice feature called Predictions. It's basically sanctioned gambling with imaginary internet points. Um, and so in our case, we use standard internet units. Um, you get units by watching the channel. Also, if you click the follow button, you'll get 300 units. Um, on Ask a Scientist Gaming, we basically use this as a means of asking science questions typically, but we're going to ask some random graduate admissions question. You are all on Ask a Scientist Gaming honor code, so answer without searching the internet, although I don't think the internet's going to help you get an answer to this particular question. I'd be, well, you never know what's on the internet. And so <laughs> the, the question that we're going to pop up on the screen right now is, how many schools did just Justin apply to less than five or greater than five. This is Justin Kenimore who's sitting to the left of me. How Hi. many schools did he apply to for grad school? So go ahead and click on either betting 10 points or whatever. You can also uh, bet unique amounts. The question is, how many did Justin apply to? And the reality is you have no way to know this other than, I don't know, if it's Carmageddon gameplay gives you any insights into <laughs> what kind of person he is. Right. My decision making yeah, on, it's, on it's this. Poor. The answer is 800 <laughs> schools. <laughs> Cast a wide net. <laughs> I cannot find my way back onto this track. There's like a on-ramp and I can't find it. There it is. I mean, you can abort and start over. Nope, I got it. Found it. Oh, what happened to that dude? <laughs> All right, so the question is, how many grad schools did Justin apply to? Is it less than five, greater than five? I mean, so there's things to consider, the number of schools you want to go to, location, maybe you can only go in proximity for family-related reasons or whatever it might be. Also, there's a financial cost for applying, right? Okay. It's going to be something like 30 to $80 per application. So a lot of things to consider when you're applying to graduate programs, which presumably went into uh, Justin's decision-making as well. Ooh, this is a close one. We got over-under, five... Greater than five, less than five, how many schools did Justin apply for? Uh, fun note, if you win internet points, you can spend them on things like request a factoid or unlock some of our emotes. It can also make us take a drink. All those are acceptable. <laughs> all acceptable. Yeah, all, all are good for us either way. <laughs> all right, last 10 seconds. Put your guesses in now or extra money. And we have a 50-50 split exactly wow. down the middle. Wow, that was a good, uh, I chose a good over-under number. That's like Vegas style right there. Yeah, no, this is really good. You got five to four plus betting on each side, 269 versus 269. All right, Justin, what's the answer? What number of schools did you apply for for graduate school? So I applied to two and a half. <laughs> Three is probably the accurate so the answer. The answer is less than five. Congratulations, whoever picked less than five. That is the number. Justin applied to two and a half to three grad schools. If you want to elaborate yeah. on that. Yeah, a, a disclaimer there. I think looking back on that now, I, I in many ways wish I had applied to more. Um, I sort of made a decision that I uh, wanted to kind of go to the research triangle area. For um, those of you not familiar, that's uh, Duke, NC State, Chapel Hill, inside that triangle. Yeah. I mean, there's great schools there. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and I made a decision that I wanted to go to that area. I had some friends from my undergraduate that moved into Raleigh, and so that was another kind of thing. It was within a few hours of home, and so I could travel home to see uh, my family and stuff like that. So there was just a lot of things that added up. Uh, and it wasn't, um, it wasn't exactly where I already was, so it was something different in addition to being something conveniently um, nearby. Uh, so. Um, I ended up applying to uh, a high aspiration school and then two uh, schools that I felt that my package was uh, sufficient for. Um, and uh, so I uh, ended up going to NC State and the rest is, uh, is history. So I, I sort of achieved the goal uh, of, of going where I wanted to and if that's kind of how you feel about the area that you want to be in and do grad school in. Again, this kind of buys into the whole concept of uh, I was under the impression that I was going to be able to go and do cool chemistry in, um, in a lot of different universities. Uh, um, so, so I just made a decision on other factors like, like those. All right, we're going to do a follow-up prediction. We'll make this one only one minute. <laughs> 
Exact same question, except how many schools did Ken apply to? Yeah. <laughs> so what do you know about me from my watching Justin play Carmageddon? <laughs> what have you elucidated I don't, about I don't know the personality? Answer to so I'm curious to hear the... Uh... Oh, man, what's your bet? Well, do you not want to buy it? Would, would that influence the... It, it uh... might. We, we better not. <laughs> I got the repulsificator. Oh, this is great. Watch this, guys. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, Professor man. Justin Kenamar, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, he's, a, he's a big child, folks. Oh, no. Uh, I apologize. We're not missing your questions. We will catch up on all of them. Um, but right now, we're going to finish up our prediction here. This is a fun one. Three schools is the answer for oh, Justin. That's one way to go. All right, 15 point. seconds. How many schools did Ken apply to? <laughs> Man, the splatter. You got to get the giants with the splatter again. That was amazing. It's hard to find all these little cute bonuses. All right, we're going to have to shorten up our answers a little and catch up on a bunch of questions here after this prediction is done. The question is, number of schools can apply to. This one was not even close. 90% said greater than 5, 10% said less than 5. That's interesting. You were 50-50 split and I was 90-10. Wow. I, the answer is greater than five. So I applied to eight graduate schools. I got accepted to uh, four or five of them, roughly half of them. And so I did a spread of safe schools plus risky schools. Ultimately, I ended up going to University of Southern California because that's where Mark Thompson was and I was really excited about OLED technology. And so that's what dro drove my decision on where to go. Um, one thing to note is the schools that I got into, two of them, I was from a PUI that didn't have a really uh, thorough research program, so I did two REUs as an undergrad. If you are competent at an REU and you meet the minimum requirements of the university, you are basically guaranteed to get in the program. Like the PI already knows you're good, you are not a risky candidate. So if you want if you want a guaranteed position or almost guaranteed position, do an REU or summer research program at the university you're interested in going to. So my quick two cents. All right, speed round, Justin, ready? Sure. Uh, I'm going to go back a little bit. I apologize for anyone. Um, all right, ready? Do you guys happen to know the academic standards of grad schools in China or outside of the states, specifically environmental and analytical chemistry? Ooh, China has a lot of universities, so I'm just going to go ahead and say, like, no on that one because it's, I, I just don't. I don't know. I don't. I, I. I have not taken the time to to analyze that. And I, to be honest, I'll be learning a little bit more about different universities uh, now that I'm going to be heavily involved in uh, reviewing international applications. But um, I'm just I'm, since this is rapid fire at this point, I'm just going to say that no, I, I don't really have too much to help with that question. All right, I'm going to say the same. I mean, the, the rankings, and here's the things about rankings, is they, they're not they're not a realistic portrayal. Like, there's a difference between a school that's ranked 90 and a school that's ranked 10, but anywhere between 50 and 80 is kind of meaningless. Anywhere between, you know, 5 and 20 is going to be meaningless because it's, it's based on very subtle metrics and things that are perception-based that don't necessarily actually describe what's going on at a university. And all the perception things are like 15 years behind reality. So I wouldn't take rankings too seriously, but again, there is a difference between top 10 and 100 to 110. Right. All right. Doo -doo -doo. I'm stuck. Uh, super scooper. Most important is what you learned and what else you could apply your knowledge to in future projects. That's tool. You're, you're, that's true. You're building a uh, tool set and how you can apply that tool set to new things. Right. Yeah, you're learning how to learn. Right. That's true. And when you go to do your postdoc, you're going to not do the same project. Uh, and and you're I would, starting over from yeah. basically scratch. Brutal, but true. Uh, but you're, you're much better at learning how to learn, how to dig into literature, how to... Uh, do the craft of, of, of learning about research. Uh, and so you'll see that. I guarantee you that when you, if, if you decide to do a postdoc, um, you'll, you'll see that you are uh, miles from where you were as a first year graduate student.
Yeah, no, it's true. And you'll see new first years come in and you'll be like, I was like that. And just shake your head. <laughs> but anyway, all right. Prince Bade wants to know, what's the best thing to do after submitting your application and waiting for a decision? Oh, I'd, I'd take my proposal and paper strategy and say, forget about it. <laughs> it's, it's out of your hands. Yeah, yeah. The, there's constructive stress and deconstructive stress. Uh, the constructive stress is what you put into the package uh, because you have control over that. Deconstructive stress is worrying about it after it's been submitted. We go through this as, as PIs. We go through this with grants, right? We submit them, we, we give it our best, and then there's no point in sitting there stressing about whether or not it's going to get funded once it's submitted, right? With that said, you'll still stress out, and the further along you get without hearing something, the more stressful it'll get, but honestly, there's nothing you can do about it, and that's, it's brutal, but that's the way it is. Same thing with submitting paper, same thing with submitting a proposal. Uh, and I think Lori answered that one. Ooh, this is interesting. How important is applying to grants and fellowships as an undergraduate? Good question. Um, I mean, I think that obviously graduating is your top priority as an undergraduate, uh, but whatever your free time looks like, and if you see some of these, uh, you know, you, what's that saying? You lose 100% of the games you don't play, right? <laughs> so, you know, if you see one of these fellowships you know, and you think that you're competitive for it, I mean, they're a little bit of work, so you want to make an assessment as to whether or not you're, you're competitive for this or you're qualified. You know, they have a very long list of like uh, requirements to, to, to be considered. Um, but if you are, yeah, go for it. Um, uh, because getting little uh, accolades like that as early and as often as possible leads to just more accolades and it leads to more confidence and, and, and they're out there because they want you to apply for these things. On the other hand, uh, it's very rare that a grad student has money going into graduate school. Like there are fellowships you can get like the NSF one, but it's just, it's very uncommon, right? There's maybe two or yeah. three per university. Um, again, chemistry, most of the sciences, if you apply to grad school, you're gonna be financially covered through either RA or TA assistantships, regardless of having a fellowship or not. And so they're not necessary, but there is a amount of prestige. It's nice to have a bigger paycheck if the award is larger. Um, but again, it's not critical. If, you, if you're not competitive, if you don't think your GPA is high enough, uh, talk to your advisor and decide whether it's worth your time and effort to apply for those. Going down the list. Ikawa wants to know, what are some tips on picking a PI slash area of research? Um, so, uh, so first of all, as an undergrad, and I'm not sure um, if you're at FSU or, or, or elsewhere, but uh, I would try to take elective courses a lot. Uh, I did this. Um, my undergraduate institution, Radford University, had a really large selection of, of, of elective courses. They weren't, part, they weren't necessary to get the chemistry major, right? For polymer chemistry was a good example. It was an elective course for an advanced undergrad. Um, there were several others, advanced organic. Um, yeah, these electives are sort of your window into these different areas of research that cross-cut boundaries from your classic general chemistry, organic chemistry, analytical chemistry, which are also areas of research. So if you like those, um, that's, a, that's, that's certainly a good start. And generally, undergrads start to get an idea of the types of areas of chemistries or the flavors of chemistries that they seem to enjoy a little bit more as an undergrad. Um, and so, um, you know, th that can be a way of, of limiting maybe the type of research areas that you're interested in. You know, some people have stories in their lives, like uh, family members that got cancer or, or just different things that happened in their life that have driven them to really want to pursue an area of research uh, focused on, on something like that. Um, and so it, it, can be, it can be different. Uh, there's no one clear answer, I think. Um, but this is my big advice. Okay, so here's my, here's my, my ending speech on this and that is that there's a lot of students that uh, 
get worried because they felt like some sort of ray of light should have come out of the clouds and like presented itself and said, you know, as if like true love hit you that this is the area of research that you want to do uh, as a grad student. And, and I would say that that's not the case for a lot of people. Um, and uh, that's okay. Uh, you don't want to be indecisive too long, but if you want to explore the, the you know, 30 different research faculty that we have in our university, uh, in our department, that do all different things, uh, that's encouraged as a grad student when you get here. Um, because there's, very, there's not a very good chance that you've had a class maybe on some of these areas that they do research in. So uh, find something that you don't hate. <laughs> that's, that's a good start, right? Yeah. At, least live in a, at least chisel out the things that you know you don't want to do. And then really buy into whatever it is that you choose and get good at it. And then you'll, you'll learn to love it because you got good at it, right? So I'm going to do a quick uh, shameless plug for FSU because it's something that I love that we do. So most universities, when you come into a program, you're not accepted to an individual research group. You're accepted to the program, which means in the fall, you're not attached to a particular group. And so what's important about that is that you, you typically get to do something called rotations in the fall of your first semester. And it's basically you spend time in a bunch of different labs, just, you know, a couple weeks getting a feel for the group, getting a feel for the research. Um, at FSU, we, we require two rotations. We make, we su strongly suggest three rotations. Um, but that's your opportunity to really get a feel. Oh, you bought a car. I did. Look at that. This is the worst handling car. <laughs> but anyway, all right, so you get to do rotations. And so one thing I really like about what FSU does is, um, so there are some programs where you get accepted as an inorganic chemist or a biochemist. Like your flavor is branded on you from the day you start and you are required to basically join that type of research group. At FSU, you're accepted to the program, which means you can take any flavor of class you want, you can join any research group you want. You are not restricted to tunnel vision that I'm an organic chemist, I have to join an organic chemistry group. And so you effectively have the option to pursue whatever group, whatever program, whatever research area, regardless of your history, regardless of what research you did previously, you get the opportunity to explore anything you want. And so again, that's something I really like that we do at FSU that you have that flexibility and those options. Great. I, I love that you refer to different disciplines as of chemistry as flavors. <laughs> That's fair. <laughs> well, j both Justin and I are very mixed flavor scientists. <laughs> I think I'm an inorganic physical materials organicer. <laughs> you are organic materials. Maybe yeah. a little analytical in there. Months. Environmental, I don't know, you could do a lot. You could, you could put a lot of monikers on polymers. Yeah. That's what's fun about what we do. We, yeah. we aren't isolated flavors. And that's one of the reasons FSU did the strategy we did, is that those disciplinary boundaries are getting blurrier and blurrier. Uh, so requiring students to pick a flavor that they're going to commit to is, it's, as far as I'm concerned, it's ridiculous at this point. All right. Palm Don Bronco wants to know how much of your time as a grad student is spent on bench slash lab versus reading literature writing. Oof. Well, very dramatically. Uh, well, depends on. Uh, I think well, the bench lab. There's a, there's a, there's an aspect to the area of chemistry that you're doing for that, right? Um. Is, is definitely not Eugene in here. <laughs> I, I don't know, Eugene, are you watching? Actually, any grad students that are in chat, go ahead and throw your numbers in there, like what percent you spend reading versus, uh, versus actually wet chemistry or computer programming, whatever it might be. But anyway, go ahead, I, sorry. I think reading is critical for anyone at, at, at the beginning. Um, you know, I, I tell my students that reading is, is extremely slow at the beginning because you don't want to, every time you get to a word that you don't know, you want to sit there and you want to figure out what that word means. And then as you do that more and more, you can read further without running into a word that you don't know. Eventually, you're reading whole papers quite rapidly because you know all the words, right? Um, so it's, it's a process. And the earlier you start, the better. Um, that being said, if you sat down and read all the time and never actually took your hands and did anything, um, there's an imbalance in that direction also. So you, you kind of have to find a happy balance of, of not only uh, doing, but also failing 
and learning from what happened and, and, and trying again. There will be a lot of that at the beginning of grad school, especially uh, in a more synthetic, uh, um, or at least my experience in the, in the synthetic area, right? So, um, yeah, both are important. And a follow up on that, it will be very fluxional. So if you start a new project, you should spend a lot of time reading, right? You don't have to reinvent the wheel if you've read through and know what has been done before uh, and what you need to do to make changes to whatever has been accomplished previously. And so, yeah, it, it, it depends. And also, if you're doing qualifying exams, you're going to read a lot more than do wet lab work. And if any graduate students are in chat, go ahead and throw your numbers in there. I don't know. It's I think a 50-50 is not unreasonable when starting out a project uh, when you're wrapping up things trying to get a paper out maybe it sw switches to 75 25 in lab versus reading then when you're actually writing it's going to shift the other way so yeah it's going to be very situational dependent uh, also discipline dependent but we sure. will all right <laughs> the rest is spent washing dishes that's true <laughs> not if you portion. take on a really good undergrad that is not how you should treat your undergrad. <laughs> Do not listen to Justin. <laughs> uh, well, first of all, learning how to wash glassware uh, uh, appropriately is a skill that I think everyone needs. Uh, so why not get that out of the way as an undergrad and then... Oh, Bojo has a good question here. Uh, all right. <laughs> Lori, no worries. We're glad you're back. Um, all right, so Bojo has a question, but we're going to put up a prediction right now. Prediction, it's time to spend some standard internet units. Throw your money at the screen right now. Let me copy and paste. Sorry. So the question was, and don't answer this, Justin, how important is a high GRE score in getting accepted? So I'm going to throw a prediction question up here right now that Justin and I came up with ahead of time. The question is... We'll give you guys two minutes to decide this. The question is, which of these parameters is a better predictor of performance in grad school, a GRE or GPA? And so let's say you have a high GRE, but a low GPA. Is that going to typically be better student or is the one that has a low GRE and a high GPA going to be a better student? And so go ahead and throw your predictions in there right now. How useful is GPA in predicting? How useful is GRE in predicting? And how important is GRE in our making a decision for someone being admitted to the program? So go ahead and throw those predictions in there right now. Man, so we had uh, Jim Fadul on. Mm -hmm. There was a 112 to one payout. Wow. The question was, when was hops added to beer? Was it <laughs> nice big heads? <laughs> So, so you might know the answer to this. When was hops added to beer? I don't remember the exact numbers, but it was, was it 750 BC or 750 AD? I would say AD. Um, but I'm probably wrong. Oops. I would say AD. I'm, no, really, I'm really just guessing. You're right. Am I right? The majority of the guess was for BC, but it was, yeah, it was AD, 750 AD. And that was when hops was added. So fermentation had existed for like... Yeah, it was like wine years. and all that was, was a thing. Yeah, um, and, and like mead and fermenting sugars. But yeah, adding hops wasn't until 750 AD-ish. It was like 765 or something. All right, last 20 seconds, make your prediction. What is a better predictor of grad school performance in terms of number of papers, in terms of success, in terms of dropout rate? Is the answer GRE or GPA? This is heavily leaning towards GPA. Somebody guessed GRE, bet the odds. <laughs> there we go. Somebody put 10 on it. A cheap scientist, way to go against the trend. If you're right, this is a 56 to one payout. The question is, which one's a better predictor, Justin, GRE or GPA? Uh, my opinion, uh, and I think there's enough facts, but uh, a GPA is certainly a, a better predictor of uh, sustained performance than a uh, one-day uh, expensive three-hour exam. So, 
I have very strong opinions about this <laughs> yes, one. I'm just going to turn it over G to you, Ken. GRE is absolutely useless. If you look at all the literature, it does nothing to predict anything. It, it, it really is not a predictor. Um, in fact, there's a quote in one of the research studies I saw. It's a better predictor at your skin color and your economic bracket than it is on anything in terms of actual ability and experiences in life. And so a lot of programs are starting to drop the GRE. Our department is waiving the GRE this year and last year. Um, ultimately, I'm pushing to get rid of the GRE entirely because it is a useless exam. It's basically who can prepare for it, who has the study guides, who has the tutors for the GRE exam. That's what's predicting their success rate, and it has nothing to do with the performance of grad school. And so yeah, the answer is GPA. So GPA, as Justin said, it's, it's much more of a sustained endeavor. And so you could say, like, you know, a GPA doesn't necessarily reflect intelligence, it just reflects who's going to work hard. And the answer is, you're right. <laughs> but guess what? Who's going to be successful in grad school? The person that works hard. And so that's why there's a correlation there. All right. Is that enough of a rant? <laughs> I, 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 I knew that you were going to step in with a, with a good rant there. And I just uh, enjoyed watching you do it. <laughs> All right. Glad we sorted that one out. So I apologize. <laughs> Uh, cheap scientists lost 10 points. Those of you that got it right got a 1 to 1.02 payout. So worth it. Alex Robb has redeemed Take a Drink. Oh. Justin, cheers. Thank you for joining me. Yeah, cheers. Second time on Ask a Scientist Gaming, this time as a um, chair of admissions rather than a polymer chemist. Yeah, this is fun. I mean, hey, I'm going to give you beer and then have you play video games that you haven't played in forever. <laughs> Sign me up. Exactly. And it's a pleasure for you guys. I We, we love having you ask questions and joining us because... Yeah, this is what makes this an entertaining experience for all of us. So if you have questions, keep throwing them in chat. I promise we'll get to them. I try to keep track. If I miss one, feel free to post it again, and I'll, I'll, I'll keep uh, trying to keep track of those. Alex, cheers. Thank you. The funny car is awful, by the way. It's terrible for steering, isn't it? Yeah. Which makes sense. <laughs> it shouldn't be good yeah. at it. Physics. All right. Swooper Scoop wants to know. Swooper Scoop. Thank you for the follow earlier today. All right, what influenced you guys to conduct the research conduct research in the first place? Weird question, don't have to answer. Oh no, it, it's a good question. It's and important. I, I um, enjoy this answer because it tells a little bit about my path, my story and, 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 and how it came to be there. Uh, so, you know, I, I finished my undergraduate degree and I honestly wasn't sure what I wanted to do. I, uh, I liked chemistry. I knew that it was an employable major. I knew that it was a major that not everyone could do uh, and that it, it, there would be some merit to pursuing that and, and, and getting that degree. So I actually went into industry for about three years before I went to grad school, um, which uh, it was a good decision for me. Uh, I learned how to do chemistry for eight hours a day and treat it like a job rather than just a bunch of individual classes. Um, but ultimately what I found out in industry was that uh, after several years that I was, I was actually capable of doing a PhD, what a person that is a PhD at this company would be expected to do as a job description, I was capable of doing that get paid less right right <laughs> and so I was being asked to do because of my competency I was being asked to do more and more and then I started to realize that you know I'm starting to do a little bit more of the PhD type things and not getting the money or the respect and that makes sense I mean they can't just uh, completely throw away the Oof. Nice. That was a good one. That was a solid <laughs> <That> hit. Poor lady. <laughs> uh, solid hit. Yeah. So um, that was the decision maker for me. I uh, uprooted and decided to go to grad school to get that PhD. And I still didn't know what it was going to be after that for me, whether I was going to go back into industry, maybe even go back to the same company. Uh, but uh, I knew that that was the next step for me. And so I kind of just played oh, it. Oh, nice. Body slammed. Played it by ear. And it turns out that the company that I worked at was a polymer analysis company. Uh, so um, I really thought that I not only got a good education and working all day on chemistry, but also like I was, I had a, I had a leg up on understanding a lot of things about polymers. And so I just really continued with that um, because I found it to be fascinating. And again, this builds into the whole 
idea that once you pick something and you start to get better at it, you start to get knowledgeable at it and recognized as, as someone that knows how to do it, you tend to start liking that area better um, a lot. So, Mutant corpses. What does this entail? I don't, I don't remember that one. I don't know. <laughs> do I have to activate it? I don't think so. It's just running. Hit somebody, see what they do. Just that. Just Twitch. <laughs> yeah, that's a mutant corpse. <laughs> there, there it is, ladies and gentlemen. In case you were curious what Carmageddon 2 Mutant Corp does, there it is. <laughs> Today I learned on Ask a Scientist Gaming <laughs> what mutant corpse is. Uh, for me, in terms of... Uh, what was the question? It was, what influenced you guys to conduct research in the first place? Um, for me, I had quite a journey as an undergrad in terms of majors. Uh, I used to be, believe it or not, a really, um, I was into a lot of sports. Like in high school, I was track and karate and football and basketball and all sorts of stuff. And I ended up getting hurt a lot. And so that means I spent a lot of time in physical therapy. So when I entered college, I thought, I want to go like the athletic training route. I want to, you know, tape ankles and treat athletes and things like that, because that's what I had experience with. But I had this series of transitions through my undergrad experience. I went from athletic training to exercise science to biomedical science to chemistry. <laughs> he found the spring again. <laughs> Stop. It's just funny. <laughs> There it is, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, um, but anyway, yeah, there were a series of just classes that I took where I was like, well, the most interesting part about this class is something that I would learn in another class. And then I progressed more and more and ended up on chemistry. He found the drug spot. Yeah. I'm sorry, kid. <laughs> no, While you're okay. trying to tell this serious, heartfelt story, I'm sitting here taking drugs and shooting people around. No, this is perfect. <laughs> oh, no. Yeah, you better heal before you land on it again. All right, so yeah, that was, uh, and I went to chemistry class and I had this really great synthetic organic, or organic chemistry teacher named Dan Gregory, uh, went up the ladder and actually became a dean, so he doesn't teach chemistry anymore, which is tragic, but a uh, great guy, I'm glad he went that path. But he like really got me interested in it, and at one point suggested, hey, maybe you should do some research, you should apply for REU programs, and that like changed my career. I did an REU at Notre Dame, kind of an accidental application. Um, and got in and found out I loved research. Don't think you want to go up one of those because it takes you on like that detour. I've learned that this yellow line and blue line at the bottom sort of point you where the next checkpoint is. Yeah, the blue line is checkpoint, yellow line is the, the other the other cars. Look at that, that car's just sitting there. Ecowall wants to know, what's your favorite molecule? What is my favorite mo oh my gosh. You want to go first, Ken? Do you have a, a no. do you have a solar component that's your favorite molecule? I have a chromophore that's my favorite molecule. So I'll, yeah, I can go first. So my favorite molecule is bispyridyl amino isoendyl, and this <laughs> this molecule is very specific. It's it was used in a lot of oxidative catalysis and then that's uh, like palladium and manganese based catalysis. Um, but I was one of the first people to use it in a uh, triplet-based chromophore system. And so something I saw at an ACS meeting when I was, I was like a second year grad student, I went to my advisor and said, hey, this might be interesting if we put it on platinum. And so most of my PhD actually ended up being on that particular molecule. And then fairly recently, I got to revisit that molecule as a proton transfer dye that actually senses zinc. And so I have a zinc sensor paper that came out recently, which is kind of fun. So. That is my favorite molecule, bispyridyl amino isoindole, BPI, for sure. Would I, would I be super boring if I said that my favorite molecule is water? <laughs> it would be cooler if you said ethanol, but <laughs> it's totally up to you. But water is so fascinating. It's amazing. Uh, it's it a great really, solvent to it lose really sight of It really is an unbelievable molecule. Yeah. I mean, it expands when it freezes, so that's like one of the first things there that's just quite unique about water versus everything else. Uh, it is, it is the smallest molecule that can do hydrogen bonding, right? Is that a, is that a fair thing? I think that's a fair uh, thing to say. HF can do hydrogen bonding. HF, which. Uh, just slightly just, smaller. Just slightly <laughs> different effect on the body than water. <laughs> yeah, that's true. I didn't know that was the parameter. <laughs> yeah, yeah. 
There's a reason that uh, they're not looking for HF on Mars. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, nothing survived here. Okay, end of story. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, water is amazing. We lose yeah. sight of that, but it is... Life cannot exist with it in its current form without water. Uh, that was a style bonus. That's what I was going for. Um, we'll just go with water. There's a lot of polymers, but I'm not going to pick any favorites. <laughs> well, that's what you did. You avoided the hard choice by picking water. Yeah, I didn't want to. I didn't want to uh, offend any of my you, polymer peeps that might be watching. Yeah, yeah. You, you could have gone with taxol. That one has a taxol is a, a very important backstory molecule to uh, to FSU. Um, uh, I I don't think I do as much justice on that backstory as as some of our more senior colleagues. Uh, yeah. Um, but it is. Oh. <laughs> That was fun. Yeah. Alex Rob C2V. I think he's talking about water. Symmetry <laughs> operators. You can figure out the vibrational modes of water based on the symmetry and character tables. Absolutely amazing in organic chemistry exercise. So, yeah, I, I, I like it. All right. Bronco wants to know, when do you typically take the PhD candidate exam, and what does it do for you when you pass? This is going to be a anticlimactic answer, unfortunately. So the time frame is, as far as I know, for, for almost everywhere, the beginning of your third year. Uh, it was that way for me, and it's that way for the students in our department. Um, so for those of you not familiar, candidacy exam typically involves, uh, some universities still do some kind of formalized testing where there's questions you have to answer. Uh, most are getting away from that, and it's more of a, uh, you give a presentation and some kind of proposal, and you have to defend that proposal in front of your PhD committee, which is consisting of three to five members of your department and an external member. Um, and so that's what candidacy is. So, sorry, go ahead, Justin. No, uh, yep, yeah, that, that's a good backstory because it's, it's not assumed that people know what this is. And it, it is, it's the, the climactic event, right? It's where you traversed from being a, a PhD student to a PhD candidate. Is like you said. So, um, and then what was the second part of the question? Just so um, I don't know. it was, what does it do for you when you pass? Uh, so yeah, that, that's the first thing is that you've you've sort of gotten through that big milestone where now you give yourself sort of candidacy status. Uh, the work's not over, but what uh, what it signifies is that uh, you know through. Through our analysis of your progress to that point in the PhD, we feel comfortable that with uh, the, the rest of your time put into developing a nice thesis that you will um, be able to get a PhD, I guess is, is the way, best way of saying it. Um, Formally, bookkeeping yeah. wise, it means at the very least you will leave with a master's degree. That's true. Prior to yep. candidacy, that's not guaranteed. If you pass candidacy, it's basically no matter what, you'll get a master's. So even if you wash out of the program, which is basically, it's, I, I don't want to say that as a negative thing. If you choose to leave or you get kicked out or some circumstance happens, at the very least, you will have a master's, which is an MS in chemistry. And so that's good for industry. You'll get paid just a little bit more than a bachelor's degree, not quite as much as a PhD. Um, but yeah, that candidacy, some universities, I think FSU now, we give a master's automatically, right? Um, Maybe Alex would know that better than I or Lori. But yeah. But yeah. <laughs> what's, what's, uh, what, what, what I said about um, it being a anticlimactic answer is that you are going to get really stressed for your qualifying exam and you're going to spend a lot of time imagining every possible scenario that can occur and you're going to go through the qualifying exam and afterwards you're going to say it's not as bad as i thought it was it wasn't i shouldn't have stressed out as much as i did and nothing is going to change for you in day-to-day -day life after you've passed that qualifying exam and you will tell the next generation of students like don't stress out too much here's what it's going to be like and they're going to go through the same cycle over and over again so that's why it's kind of an anticlimactic but an important milestone it's critical to getting your de degree so i don't want to belittle it in that respect uh yeah also <laughs> i'm going to throw one more thing out there I, I know qualifying exam looks like a hurdle and that's what you're trying to do is you're trying to jump through hoops and clear hurdles on your way to your phd but you can also look at this as an opportunity right you have a committee of five individuals that are experts in their field and it is your chance to shine like you can come through and say 
look at me, I'm great. Like I should be up for departmental awards. You should want to write letters of recommendation for me. You should be talking to your friends about me because I'm so good at this. And so you can look at it as a hurdle, but also as an opportunity to show what you have, like demonstrate your knowledge, demonstrate your expertise, demonstrate your creativity. That's ultimately, that's what your ideal scenario is. Justin, I apologize. I'm diatribing a lot. No. I don't know if it's being two beers in or... <laughs> but 850 does have a kick. It, it does. It, it sneaks up on you. Uh, but I, I agree with everything that you say, that I've been saying. So it's, it is it is an opportunity to shine. And to be honest, you know, I know that there's a lot of stress put on it. But I, I feel like um, students that, that prepare well don't really have much to worry about. Uh, it's good that you're worried. You know, it, it's good that you take it seriously. It's good that you go a little bit of the extra mile to just brush up on a few little fundamentals that are a part of your research. Um, but uh, you know, your your caliber as a graduate student is sort of already being recognized by the time you get to that candidacy exam. So. Yeah, if, if we're going to be honest off the record, even though this is recorded for YouTube, is we know, I mean, 95% of the time ahead of time, how that qualifying exam is going to turn out. Just based on the history of the student and what we know about the student and their previous performance. Um, so yeah, it's your, your opportunity to either show that that's wrong or demonstrate that it's right, right? And that's, that's kind of what the qualifying exam is. Um, with that said, there are some scenarios. I mean, I, I've had students where we, you know, one of our best students to come through FSU in recent history, we had them redo their 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 first page of their proposal because they weren't proposing things. They were talking about all their results. And so uh, don't necessarily have to take it as a failure, more as a learning experience because they wanted to go into academia. We thought it was worthwhile that they learn how to write a proposal page. And so that's what we did. All right. Calm Down Bronco wants to know, how did you decide what to research after you finish your PhD slash postdoc? Original ideas. How do you come up with those? So as in, what did I do? How did I decide on what I wanted to do as a postdoc? Or how did I decide on like this job that I currently have? Let's say after your postdoc, your independent career, when you have power over decision making, well, true power over decision making. Yeah. I I think the general advice that your postdoc advisor and your graduate advisor uh, will give you about writing kind of uh, the the prospectus of research that you want to be interested in is is, is um, you, know, you you go into grad school and you get an expertise and then it's highly recommended that you go into a postdoc and you get a different area of expertise and if you do this right you might be able to take the graduate experience, the postdoc experience, and put it together into you being a unique person with two different skill sets that when you marry them together, you have the ability to uh, look at completely different things than, than maybe some other people are doing, right? Uh, and so there's a spirit of, of that type of mentality that was a part of my research sort of package when I applied, you know, hey, I went as a grad student and did this, then I went as a postdoc and I learned all this, let's marry them together, chocolate and peanut butter, look at how uh, amazing kind of things that we can discover with, with these two things together, right? Um, but, you know, there's always that, that third research idea that's just kind of like a Hail Mary. Out there, yeah. Um, that you're just kind of like going wild thing with and and, uh, and just trying to show that you are, are, are quite creative and you know some people might just flat out tell you there's no chance of this working. <laughs> but then, yeah. Maybe it accidentally does and you get a 2021 Nobel Prize in chemistry. Yeah. <laughs> Have but, you heard that? The story of Dave McMillan, the, the proline reaction? I guess it was a grad student just trying something. Oh, yeah. And yeah. used the wrong reagent. Yep. Yeah, that was a really great story. And that's one, that's one that the grad students had to hear. Yeah. Um, I don't remember all the details of the story, but it was yeah. basically the student messed up. Like, again, that's going to happen. Uh, but by messing up what the student did right, was uh, to realize that something unexpected had happened and and looking into it enough to figure out what that was. And what, what it was was a discovery that the student had used the wrong reagent to do this reaction. And that specific reagent, which was not part of the entire intellectual process of this of this reaction, 
ended up doing something completely different than expected. And the students grit, again that word grit, to not just say, oh, I screwed up, throw the reaction container into the trash can or the waste container and start over with the right reagent, uh, ended up leading to an incredible discovery um, and an incredible story. So there's a lesson, right? A related diatribe. Um, so one of the things I don't like is when students come to me and say something didn't work. Because <laughs> the thing right. is, it did something, <laughs> right? It might not have been what you originally intended, but it did something. And so it's important to know what working means in this context and what not working means. Because um, sometimes it not working in the right way leads you to literally a Nobel Prize. And so, um, yeah, I, I, I try to ban the, the phrase, this didn't work, because it did what it was supposed to do. The question is, what did it do? And so you can say, it didn't make this, but I think this is why, or I think this is what it did. And so that can be very insightful, if not as insightful as the actual positive outcome. All right, Inspecta Betch. In the world today, which would you recommend for an undergrad finishing a BS in chemistry? Find a job in industry or go to grad school? I would say if you're not sure about the answer to that question, go get a job in industry. Um, what you don't want to do is go to grad school unsure if you want to go to grad school. Uh, and I say this for the betterment of not only your time, but you know, there's there's a, just there's a lot of good reasons not to go to grad school if you're not sure that you want to go to grad school. For me, I went into industry and learned a little bit about the process and, and what a PhD is asked to do specifically in industry. Uh, even though I didn't go back into industry, uh, I did appreciate that time quite a bit. Um, and uh, you're, you're asked to, you know, kind of problem solve a little bit more as a PhD. You're asked to lead. You're asked to lead maybe a small team of people to, to accomplish a task and, uh, and have a lot of, uh, of, of um, ability to kind of read and, and learn about whatever it is you're doing. So um, it's a good experience. Look at that car. Ooh, look at that one. It's got blades on the front. <laughs> Cuddle puppy. Next, you're going to tell me something crazy like you can use bread mold to create antibiotics. <laughs> what a lunatic. Cuddle puppy, wake. welcome back. Avert your eyes. We're smushing some dogs with cars. <laughs> uh, Justin is. I'm not. My, yeah. hands are, my hands are washed of this. <laughs> I, I, you know, if, if, you, if you found a passion for research as an undergrad, I mean, and, and you really just, it just... Get you, get you salivating about science and you, you found that passion, uh, yeah, go go do grad school. That's that's exactly where that passion can be uh, further explored and, and exploited uh, in, in a really fun and meaningful way, right? So I will say when I see, if you go industry first and then apply for grad school, I look more favorably on somebody that has industry experience versus not, because there's a certain level of training and rigor that comes from an industry job like the expectation yep. for an industry Safety. employee is very different than an undergrad student. Like life experience, development, you know, professionalism. It's good, like, make no mistake, that industry experience is, is very good training for you. I mean, again, obviously it depends on the experience and it could be horrible, but for the most part, I think it's, uh, it's very important. Um, Ikawa, thank you for swinging by. Yeah, study solid state chemistry. Or throw your questions in chat. We'll be happy to try to answer them. But thank you for swinging by. Again, if you have any questions, you can email me or Justin or Lori. Any of us are happy to answer. Again, it's been a pleasure. Uh, thank you for throwing your questions in chat. And good luck on solid state chemistry in your upcoming exams. All right. Visiting questions. So we're 912. Anyone just joining us? Uh, this is Ask a Scientist Gaming. Today we are combining mediocre gameplay with expert level advice on admissions and applications for graduate school. Uh, joining me today is uh, the <laughs> illustrious <laughs> graduate admissions chair of FSU Department of Chemistry and Biochemistry. <laughs> Justin is happy, to, is happy to answer any questions regarding admissions, applications. Um, he'll also answer questions about polymers. So <laughs> feel free to throw any of those guys in chats. Uh, in chat, um, yeah. Uh, a Rob also said it also been nice to have some money prior to grad school. You can save up in industry yeah. all the time. That's oh, and, and a good point. Uh, if if you go into industry and there's a thought at all that you might want to go to grad school in a few years or something like that, 
be careful not to put yourself into a financial burden to where you can no longer not work that job. Because you might get paid a little bit more as a bachelor's degree in industry than you will as a graduate student. That's just par for the course. And so if you buy like a house or you buy a fancy car that you're not going to be able to resell for what you paid for it, um, you're now locked in financially and unable to sort of uproot and take a pay cut and go to grad school as, as easily. So keep that in mind. You know, just for a few years, maybe you know, put some put some money in the bank and and have a have a good time uh, on on football Saturday from here and there, right? So, um, yeah, yeah. But uh, again, those not familiar, and I didn't know this until I literally applied for graduate school. You get paid to get a PhD, like you get yeah. funding. It's it's not a lot. It's it depends where you go. If you're in like downtown New York at Columbia, you get something like 38,000 a year at FSU. It's 24,000 cost of living is a major factor in that. Um, but it is, I, I think, and <laughs> a Rob and others in chat can correct me, but it is enough for a livable wage. And so I went to grad school at, um, uh, university of Southern California in downtown LA and my stipend in 2005 to 2010 was between, I think 24,000 a year and 28,000 a year. And so it's enough to survive, but not necessarily live a luxurious life. So you figure out creative ways to have fun and entertain yourself. All right, calm down, Bronco, and some uh, exchanges with uh, Faithful Fairy. Um, on average, how much does a PhD make compared to a bachelor in industry? So you have experience with that. Yeah, and I worked at a small company, um, which w will, you know, the, the size of the company might, and and where it's located might dictate a little bit of what the salary is. Uh, for example, you're going to need more money to like live in California or New York City, um, and, and so so income is adjusted accordingly. I think, uh, but uh, uh, typically uh, it, it's quite a bit more for for a PhD. At least at, at least I say 150 percent. Would that be an accurate? You think an error? So let's say if you made 35,000 as a bachelor's degree, you could make Man, so the brackets so I seen about 100 the, six figures as a as a PhD. Yeah. yeah, so the number range I think I saw the I mean it's been a couple of years since the ACS put out like their their numbering system or the last time I saw it, but it was like uh bachelors you're going to get between 30 and 60 depending on the city. Um masters it's going to be between 50 and 80. And then PhD, it's going to be 80 and above. I think, you know, six figures as a PhD is not off the wall. Like, I was blown away when my first grad student was making, you know, 125% what I make right off the bat. Yeah. <laughs> and like, professor is supposed to be this, like, really prestigious job that's like the equivalent of going pro in academia, but <laughs> the pay is not as good as industry, <laughs> I'm going to be honest here. <laughs> I think the, the students that graduate with a PhD and leave my lab make more money than me yeah. uh, right out of the gate. Um, industry just pays more money. Yep. Um, <laughs> I'm going to say rightfully so. Who needs us to pursue our random crazy ass ideas? <laughs> <laughs> Most of the time will not work, but we love that flexibility. That's why we do what we do. Um, so yeah, Faithful Fairy had a response here from some industry experience. PhD as a student stipend, I made 27 to 30K. Now I make 85,000 through um, though, and head of pharma pays 100K. So yeah, six figures is not off the wall. Uh, again, it depends heavily on location. Also over time, how much you work. Like if you go, go work for Intel right off the bat, which a lot of my students do, I think you start at something like 125,000, but you also have a bunch of overtime, a lot of weird hours, so there is a cost-benefit analysis there. All right, I think we are officially caught up on questions. That was a speed round of 45 minutes <laughs> catching up. Yeah, that's that's awesome questions. Awesome questions, everyone. Uh, and and seriously, it's it's sometimes the questions that people are apprehensive to ask that I think are are most important to ask when leading into a big decision like this. You know, grad school is a big decision, so. Oh man, what is the what is the most crazy, non-judgmental? We will not judge. Throw your questions in chat right now. What do you want to know? What are you confused about? And uh, unafraid to ask. Use your anonymous name right now yeah. and throw them in Twitch and. We, we will not judge you. We were happy to answer those questions. It's not every day you get, you know, guys like us distracted by uh, 
you know, Carmageddon <laughs> drinking beer to just answer you honestly, right? Yeah. He just give you a straight up answer. And yeah. uh, I, I will I will do that to the best of my ability. Yeah, and make no mistake, Justin and I are very transparent people. We are straight shooters. Like this is not to bullshit you or lie to you or try to convey something we don't believe in. Uh, we're going to give you honest answers. Okay. Uh, with that said, I'm happy to shamelessly plug uh, apply to <laughs> FSU Department of Chemistry and Biochemistry. There is the link right there in chat. Click on that button right there. <laughs> um, yeah, you guys can apply to our program. We'd be happy to see your applications and we will see your applications if you do apply. Uh, and we'd love to have you admitted and come visit the program because you know, we, we love having people come out and see our department and our university and our equipment and tools. Um, hey, Rob just put something in chat. Salaries from CNE News. Let's see what numbers come up with that. Uh, overall salaries, they've increased since 2016. Uh, so this puts a doctorate at 104,000, master's at 88, bachelor's at 78,000. So that's gone wow. up quite a bit. Now, does that say that it's like um, averaged for a metropolis area or a rural area? I think this is averaged across the board. Okay. When you adjust for inflation, that goes down quite a bit. That's interesting. So yeah, check out that link. Thank you, Alex, for posting that. That's, uh, that's really informative. <laughs> If you guys answer my question, uh, Blue Hook and Barry, what was your question? Throw it in chat again. We're happy to answer it again. Oh, they break it down by regions further down in that document. So yeah, check that out. Check out salaries. Um, it's worth taking a look. Uh, yeah, it's probably not entry level. It's probably average over a period of time. Yeah, you can get raises. Um, there's still a structural system. Even to being a PhD, you can be a uh, uh, a senior analyst or, or senior senior analyst one, senior analyst two. You know, just like uh, uh, any any kind of structure. All right, so Justin, we are at nine twenty one. You yep. want to play a different game? I, I'm almost about to be done with this game. So I made it to that red level, you know? Yeah. And oh, gonna, this is it? This is it, yeah. All right. So we're going to we're gonna complete this level, which I think I'm going to be able to do if I can get to this checkpoint. <laughs> oh, you don't get time for checkpoints. That's crazy. No, you don't. But... This game's so unrealistic. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, questions you have for admissions, graduate school, FSU chemistry, Polymer chemistry, we are happy to address any of those. Uh, Justin's expertise at Carmageddon, also happy to answer those questions. <laughs> the answer Absolutely. is, this game's too realistic. This was actually one of those controversial games that really started the, like, we need a rating system. So. Yeah. But, again, uh, just a way to blow off theme. It's not too complex. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's... It's not to be taken too seriously. <laughs> Texas Space Agency, welcome back. If I remember correctly, you're an economist. Very different grad experience in economy, than economics than there is in chemistry. But <laughs> welcome back. Today we have something special. We're not necessarily talking science. We're talking graduate school admissions, applications, all aspects of the graduate school experience. Uh, agricultural applied. That makes sense. <laughs> Very nice to have you back. Anyone else, if you have questions, throw oh, them yeah. in chat. We are happy to accumulate those. If not, I'll fall back on some of my questions that'll be modified to relate to graduate school experience as well as um, applications and admissions process. Is there anything you can think of that would shock people about the application admission process? Well, so... Um, I think they might be surprised to hear that we do put a lot of effort into making sure that we've covered... No! I know. I, I, I got hung up on a blood stain or something and I'm spinning out for like 10 minutes. <laughs> we do we do put a lot of effort into, you know, if you are if you if you have a metric that's close to kind of the, the lower end of what we consider to be like uh, uh, acceptable... Um, that we don't just like throw your application uh, over into a, a burn barrel, right? 
uh, we do put a lot of effort into looking at your personal statement and your other uh, your other metrics, which could be you know again research, um, uh, you know your letters that that are written, um, because again, you know there's there's always diamonds in the rough that that for whatever reason. Um, one metric might not fully quantify uh, the the totality of the person's potential. So, so. I, I was that person, and I, I yeah. literally have the story recounted to me. So my my verbal GRE score was not great, mostly because I I cannot take a test for three hours, and I abacadabbed the last half hour of it. Um, but my GPA was a three point one something, and so when I applied to USC, it was I was a borderline case there. I'd be a borderline case at FSU as well. I had some research experience, so that shined brightly on me. Uh, but I sent an email to Mark Thompson, who was the person that I was interested in working for. And, and the graduate student that I worked for in fifth year actually overheard the conversation with admissions. And it was basically after my conversation with Mark, he talked to the person at admissions and they're like, should we let this person in? They're a borderline case. And he's like, yes, you should. He asked the right questions. And so Mark basically took a chance on me thinking that I would be a good admissions case. And it was a very specialized circumstance, but I was that borderline. I was that risky student that he was willing to accept. And hopefully he doesn't regret that decision. I don't think he does, but I'm really grateful for it because he took a chance on me. And so that's something I like to think about when I you know, process these applications. Like these are individuals, they have their own experiences, they have different backgrounds, what makes them stand out, what makes them different, that's what we want to know. So like Justin said, we do take a lot of time to do it. Yeah. Exactly. Doing this one more time, Ken, but with the red car, which is uh, clearly better than any of these cars. Isn't it bottom. though? It's a, they, they gave you the best car to start with, which is an interesting choice. All right, Calm Down Bronco wants to know, how did you guys deal with burnout during some of your really high hour times in grad school? Is having a hobby outside the program recommended? Absolutely. Oh man, great question, Bronco. Um, this is this is a, something that I preach uh, a lot, that you know, even the, even the best and most motivated need to go get some sun on their face every once in a while. Uh, I don't want to run you into the earth as a graduate advisor. I want you to uh, come to a, a serious analysis of you and your time when you need uh, a, a little bit of a break, right? Um, you know, in Florida, you can take a three-day weekend and just go go to the beach and just relax in, in the sand uh, and come back refreshed and ready to work. And you're probably going to be twice as productive that next week than you would have been if you had uh, um, just, you know, not taken the break. Uh, so... Uh, you, you know, you want to temper the expectations that graduate school, you know, there's there's a time investment that's needed to really get to where you want to be. So you can't go to maybe every wedding that all of your friends have during the time when you're in grad school. You might have to skip a couple and you might, um, you know, need to... Uh, another thing is you might need to work more like an industry job where you don't get three weeks off for Christmas, right? You know, that, that's the difference between undergraduate uh, and, and graduate school is that you're, you're now in a position where there's some really valuable weeks like spring break and, uh, and, and the holidays just working a little bit longer into December where you can get a lot done. You're not distracted with things like your TA assignments and other things. But other than that... Um, you know, I I have a rule in my lab. If if you break more than if you break three pieces of glassware in a day, you're done. Go home, <laughs> because clearly you need sleep or something's going on, right? Yeah. Uh, so, um, uh, and, and to this day, I don't think anybody's broken three pieces of glassware just to go home. So, <laughs> <laughs> you're just in there, done. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Juggling. I'll go. Uh, go. go. Yeah. <laughs> See you later. Uh, Gotta go to a wedding. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's right. That's a generally good strategy. <laughs> one, one thing I will say about the vacation thing, and this was true for me as a student and true for how I treat my students, is the students that are working hard and successful, if they go to their PI and say, I want to go on vacation, they will never be told no. Like, there won't be any hesitancy. There won't be any discussion. Like, you're getting shit done. Nobody's going to hound you if you want to take an extra couple days on a weekend to go to a wedding. But if you're like the mediocre case or you're not getting your stuff done or you're questionable, as soon as your professor takes a deep breath and they're like, 
Well, like, you know that you're that borderline case. So it's, it's, yeah, work hard when you have to, or like when you, when you can, and then it's not going to be an issue if you need some additional time off. Yeah. But um, going back to Justin's uh, comment, like, I, I spent a lot of grad school getting high and playing video games. <laughs> not, <laughs> not necessarily during work hours, but like weekends, days off, like you have a release, like you have a way to mediate mitigate for stress and yeah. find what that outlet is so for me it was video games and now i'm a professor doing ask a scientist game yeah. so i did video games i played golf uh frisbee golf as well i like frisbee golf and and uh i, I actually played i think i played more golf in grad school than i do now as a professor uh, because it was an important part of uh me getting some much needed exercise and and time outdoors uh um but uh yeah it's it's good for the soul whatever you know you guys trust yourselves know yourselves a little bit better than than your advisor does as far as your you know, your mental health and your and your your need for some uh a reprieve right yeah and don't be afraid to like ask for help in terms of like your advisor is not going to be able to counsel you but they can point you in the right direction like no joke mental health for graduate students and undergraduate is becoming an increasingly larger problem like, and it's just stress the world, the availability of email all the time. Like, I'm glad I'm not going to grad school now because the email circumstance is different than it was 15 years ago. Yeah. Like, we get bombarded constantly now. I can't imagine a grad student getting a 5 a.m. email. So, yeah, pretty brutal. Yeah, self-care is very important. I mean, especially in grad school because you don't get those years back. Like, it affects your health and well-being. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, push yourself, but not to the point of insanity. You know what else is fun in grad school? Conferences. Yeah. Um, you know, as we were talking earlier about how you're going to read all these papers. Well, you're going to start to recognize some of these names in these papers. They're going to become kind of like heroes to you because you're going to be super impressed by their, by their work. You're going to be like a fan of their, of their research. And then I remember my first conference. It was like a vacation and a reward and science all at once. I got to meet some of these heroes that, that I had... Um, read plenty of papers on and talk with them and and uh, give, a, give a talk and usually these conferences are in you know different places nice San Francisco San Diego Chicago New Orleans right? Philadelphia yeah. Yeah. yeah 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 no I, I have a follow-up on that because that was one of my openers as a grad student it was like my third year in grad school I went to a conference and Bill Castellano you might know Phil. He's at NC, NC State now, but but Phil, like, I was there with a couple students from my group, and he knew Mark Thompson, and he was like, "I'm gonna take you guys under my wing." And so he like took us around. We went out drinking with Phil, and he was buying, and he like snuck us into a Northwestern alumni event that we got free food, <laughs> and then he took us to this wine bar and bought a really nice bought bottle of wine, and like, I will never forget that event. And so Phil was, I mean, he's been a letter writer for me. He's also, we recently collaborated on a paper and that was, that was born out of my third year in grad school at a conference meeting Phil and getting to know him there. He's a really great guy. And so I'll yeah. try to do similar things for students when I eventually go back to conferences, whenever that happens. All right. Yeah. We're moving on to something else. I, did, I officially cr uh, completed group one. All right. So. What do you want to do? You want to do um, bases loaded or Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles? <laughs> Man, you got some, some tough questions tonight. <laughs> <laughs> Survey the audience. <laughs> yeah, ask the audience if they have a preference on what they'd like to watch. All right, I'm not going to put up an actual Any survey. If anyone has strong opinions, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles are bases loaded. Throw it in yeah. chat right now. Anyone who saw me go the first uh, the first round of uh, Ask a Scientist Gaming uh, might might be wanting to see a rematch of bases loaded sooner rather than later. But <laughs> Cuddle Puppy wants Dark Souls. <laughs> Dark Souls. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> give it give him one second I mean, to like to, vote to, in I'll be, I'll to be fair quick. teenage mutant ninja turtles is the dark souls of nintendo <laughs> it is one of the hardest nintendo games sure we're going to use cheat codes but <laughs> it is a good one uh lori i'm assuming you're trying to put your email in there uh at chem.fsu.edu sorry it does an automatic filter um, I think this is going to be Lori's email address. If you guys have questions, go ahead and throw her there. <laughs> Kerbal Space Program, yes. No, your options are Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles 
or <laughs> uh, bases loaded. Do you want to see a baseball game or do you want to see turtles fighting uh, foot soldiers, I guess? And a bunch of weird other creatures as well. All right, I got it right. That's awesome. Okay, so yeah, if you, you have questions for uh, the Chemistry Graduate Advisor, uh, Lori Hayes is happy to answer those. Her, her email address is right there in chat right now. So feel free to send your questions her way. Or to me or to Justin, I promise we'll, we will find an answer. So go ahead and look us up on the FSU Chemistry website, um, or you can find help um, right here. That should give you a link for people to look up and people to contact regarding questions. Um, yeah, the, the department in our email address is actually something they've gotten rid of fairly recently. That's a, it's a relic from old times, but turns out it was pretty useful in terms of having multiple email accounts. So yeah, kind of interesting. All right, so what do we, no one has said anything. Okay, well then let's do basis loaded because I've been waiting for this. Basis loaded, it's time for the rematch. It is time for the rematch. We'll do Ninja, Ninja Turtles as a uh, pre narc. <laughs> the pre narc warm up. Yeah, the pre. <laughs> Give me the... Yeah. We'll progress from sports to uh, 2D. All right. Are we going to do that? Uh... Oh, you want to do, you want to do split and we're going to time this? Ladies no, and gentlemen. No, well, we can time it, but there's the. Is there the question? Did you want to. Is there a, a poll question for the uh, over under? Oh, yeah. Let's do that. All yeah, right. Let's do so it now you... before I put in uh, a pinch hitter by accident. <laughs> <laughs> All right, ladies and gentlemen, Justin Kinnemer is going to be playing Bases Loaded for the second time in about 20 years. Um, we had a question the first time he played this. The question was, was Justin going to hit more or less than 1.5 home runs? So the question was, is he going to hit 0 or 1 or greater than uh, 1.5? So we're going to throw this one up there. This is not a science question. This is not an interest, uh, uh, admissions question. Instead, this is a Justin Kennemar, how good is he at this game? Yeah. <laughs> what have you learned about this is, Justin? This is DraftKings bases loaded addiction. <laughs> exactly. So uh, if you're not following, click the follow button, get your standard internet units that you can spend on asking for factoids or us to take a drink. Um, you can gamble them on questions like this. Will Justin hit more than two or more home runs or yeah, one or less home runs? Throw your predictions in there right now. You have about a minute and 45 seconds. And, and as a, as a uh, um, factoid to that, uh, I was I hit zero home runs. <laughs> zero. It's a physics and game theory question. Also experiential, he hit zero last <laughs> Zero. So. But it was the first time that I'd play the game. Man, they got faith right now. Three people have said greater than 1.5. There, we, there we go. One has said less. Uh, realist. No, I like it. Sports betting. This is imaginary internet points. This is fine. This is sanctioned by Twitch. <laughs> Sponsored by Proof. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Proof Beer 850. <laughs> Find it at your Tallahassee grocery store. Well, they keep showing home runs in the... Uh... And, and the, the preview, little, like, preview. Yeah, yeah. so everyone's they're getting misleading. Yeah, get home run. People happier. think they're going to be easier than they are. All right, thirty seconds. Again, if you're not following, click follow. Get your standard and internet units that you can pay on gambling on games. Faithful fairy, yes, go all in. You have nothing <laughs> to lose here. <laughs> it's worth the payout. <laughs> Just watch more. You'll get more internet points. All right, so you can start picking your team. All right, I'm going to get a beer. Are you good? Are you good? Are you good? I'm. Pretty low, so let's go ahead and just re up while we're. I don't have a password. Hey, Kenimer. Hey, can well it's Kansas, but I don't know why. I just like K. Kansas. This was Kansas. This was Royals back in the day. Yeah. The one thing about this game is that you don't get to pick your opponent. Once you pick your team, it randomizes who you mm -hmm. play, which can be. Uh, which is an issue for speedrunning. So are we speedrunning this? It's official. Um, I mean, second time in 40 years or whatever it was, 30 years, not 40 years, good lord, 30, right. 30 20. So uh, we, we can try. We can, right. Let's just, hey, we got to have a benchmark time. I'm <laughs> yeah. going to beat it at some point. Exactly. All right. Uh, hey, Rob is redeemed. Take a drink. Justin, cheers. Everyone, okay. thank you for joining us on Wednesday night for drinking and video games. 
Um, happy to be here answering your questions. Throw them in chat right now. Should finish this one first. Play Cheers. Off. Cheers. All right, we got an over under. All right. Most of the audience or the confident people have bet 534 greater than 1.5 versus 100 less than 1.5. All right. All right. We're putting in Patson. Let's right. go. I don't know when to click go on this. I haven't looked at the speed run, but I'll do it as soon as it goes to the main gameplay. My guess would be when the first pitch is through. That's when you would start, right? I think it's right there when he says play ball. Okay. Would be my guess. Well, I need to start pitching. Uh, how's that for a start? Oof. It's looking good. Looking good. <laughs> All right. Any particular reason base is loaded? This is just a classic that you love to play back in the day. Absolutely. I played this so much. Uh, I was a huge, huge baseball nut. I love baseball and and just played baseball and yeah. Um, one thing to note, A Rob, in terms of your betting, defense wins games, but it doesn't win predictions. So <laughs> <laughs> even if he has the best defense in the world, it's not going in his favor necessarily. But are you batting or hitting? I'm pitching. You're pi okay. Batting or hitting? <laughs> Jesus Christ! It's been a while. <laughs> All right, we got some questions to catch up on. Uh, I'll switch it up as to not bore people. <laughs> no worries, boo. Uh, Blue, Blue Hawk can ask any question you have. We are happy to answer them multiple times. But the question is, how many hours is a typical work week for a PhD student in the U.S.? How much did you guys work versus postdoc and then professor? So, I think I think the demand does have uh, fluctuations. So, for example. Your first semester is kind of brutal because you're you're managing a lot. Of, you're doing a lot of time management. You're 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 learning a lot of new things. You're taking classes. You're learning how to be a TA. You're deciding on your research group. So you know it's pretty much an investment a, a lot in that in that first semester for time management, and it can it can feel a little bit uh, overwhelming. But at the same time, uh, you get uh, I think a little bit more of a, a straight line path of your of your day to day activities as you go through grad school. Uh, so you get into the research, and you know, research can be tough at first. It can beat you up because everything's new and and you're learning, and you're, you're probably going to have to fall off the horse and get back on it, and 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 it doesn't reward you right away. And so that's kind of the real the, the bigger challenge. There we go. The bigger challenge with grad school is to get over that hump, that, that initial hump of kind of learning everything, failing a little bit, reading a lot. Um, but I guarantee you that if you persist through that, uh, through that point, then the, 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 the powers that be of research, they start to reward you with good results. You start to gain confidence. You start to understand your project to the point where you can see kind of like how the paper is going to evolve. And then um, I find that when people finally get to that point, uh, they work more hours, not because they have to, but because they generally are just super excited to get up in the morning and go get this experiment uh, analyzed and see how it went. Mm -hmm. um, uh, that's my hope for people when they go to grad school, that they get to that point. And not everyone does. And I think it's because, again, the first maybe year to year and a half kind of beat you up a little bit. So um, are you willing to share your numerical answer? Industry uh, versus grad school versus postdoc versus professorship? versus. So they want a numerical hours yeah. per week answer. Yeah. Okay, so grad school, I'd say that most weeks you should plan on working some on the weekends. So that would mean uh, five solid days in the lab uh, during the week, which would be, you know, somewhere in the maybe nine to 10 hour range. So that would be 50 hours during the week with maybe a half day put in on the weekend and then a full Bases day. Bases loaded, ladies and gentlemen. Full day off. Bases loaded. Get some out of there, man. <laughs> oh, double, double played. Oh no! Sorry. Anyway. And it was my leadoff. I mean, my, my cleanup hitter. Mm -hmm. uh, anyway, yeah, you're gonna have to put some time in at the beginning, uh, a lot more uh, to to really get off to the start that you want to get off on. I think um, postdoc. 
again, this is a thing where I, I put in I put in a lot of work as a postdoc. I worked 10 hour days, probably five days a week and took one day off and really enjoyed that day, like really planned it out so that I would have some mental reprieve and it wasn't just a, you know, a wasted day. Um, and the point is, is that, you know, a postdoc is a two to three year time frame where you're being asked to uh, kind of develop a completely new project, publish papers, and you need to publish papers if you're going to apply for academic positions. So there's just a immediate pedal to the metal need with a postdoc. Um, industry, however, uh, in a lot of cases, you're working the 40 hour a week. Um, and that appeals to a lot of people. They, they want to have you know, a very healthy amount of time that they're not working and a healthy amount of time that they are working. Um, and and so if that's for you, then that's a decision that, that you want to make. Um, national labs are the, the last thing. Those, I don't, I don't know how those work. Do you I think know? they're pretty rigorous on ours. I think they're closer to industry than academia. Okay. Yeah, like in terms of the paperwork they have to apply to to do reactions after hours and like waste management and all sorts of stuff. Sure. So, yeah. Yeah. 70 plus. I mean, it depends on the discipline too. I mean, synthetic organic chemistry, like natural product synthesis, they typically hire demand hours just because it depends on the nature of the work, right? So you can spend 10 hours at work, but if you spend two of those hours waiting for something, it's very different than if you're doing something nonstop the entire time. Um, with that said, if I had to answer, I'd say early in graduate school, I was probably hitting like 70 to 80 hours a week. Um, that was before I basically got together with my wife <laughs> and so didn't have that personal life to get back to. Uh, then it probably went to, you know, 60 hours or so the remainder of grad school. Postdoc, like Justin said, you're ramping up right away. You spend a lot of time very early on. Uh, the nice part about grad school is you don't have TA duties, you don't have classes. All you're doing is research. And so I'd say 60 to 70 was not unusual. First three years an assistant professor, Debbie actually made me do the math at some point, And the answer was it was over 70 hours a week. And that was related to everything associated with it, right? Between emails and reading stuff at home and going out to dinners with guest speakers, a lot of time. Now I'd say with two daughters plus daycare pickup, I'm probably somewhere in the range of 50 to 60 hours a week. So yeah, it varies dramatically and it depends on what you want to do and what you want to get out of it. I've chosen a very specific path. So um, yeah, varies dramatically. All right, Faithful Fairy, follow up on borderline case thing. How should a, a borderline person shine out? Oh, this is regarding applications, borderline case applications. I wasn't particularly brilliant, but my research advisor, uh, luckily, lucky to get two as an undergrad, liked me enough, I think, <laughs> that at least I got through the door and then met my boss who was patient enough to, to make me graduate. I mean, that's, that's where the letter of recommendation will come out. But what are the, the key things for you when you see a borderline case? For, for me as an advisor or, or as an admissions as person. an admissions um yeah i mean yeah. I, oh okay. so i i would say that 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 again you know some some uh, research experience and, and and potentially put into the letter uh that that level of comprehension of the research that you did and and and, and what you accomplished is is quite important. Um, maybe the most important thing, and 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 the reason I say that is because uh, I think that you know we're, we're all humans. We're we're kind we're kind of snowflakes, right? Um, no one's built exactly the same, and as a result, you know someone just might not be um, an all star at sitting in a desk and taking a test for an hour and a half, but. They, they might have a lot of intangibles that when they go into the lab, they, they put together really thoughtful experiments and they, and they focus in on the problem and, and they analyze things in a very cryptic way that maybe you don't get, you don't get uh, tested for in, in a standardized exam, right? So, you know, um, a grad student kind of requires a lot of different skills and um just like i mean maybe a baseball player right a baseball player might 
uh, field the ball well, throw the ball very accurately, but not hit so great. And so you go into the, the, the majors and the coaches are going to work on your hitting um, because you've got the other intangibles. Uh, and in grad school can be thought of the same way. You might be really good, hands-on, a tinkerer, someone that can fix things, someone that applies common sense to a lot of logical problems. Um, but you might need some help in uh, organic chemistry a little bit, like some of the fundamentals. And uh, we can work with you if, if you have a weakness in one area and a strength in the other. But if you have no desire to kind of work on the general craft in any area, that's going to become kind of a problem, I think, right? So. <laughs> Cuddle Puppy had a comment. I'm sorry, I thought this was a question regarding the breaking glassware. <laughs> what if I'm doing research on the fragility of glass? It's <laughs> <laughs> a good question. Then you are doing your job. <laughs> exactly. And you are allowed to stay. Yeah, stay indefinitely. <laughs> Break as much as you need. <laughs> Faithful Fairy, I think my lab's policy was $200 of anything broken, then it's time to go home. Uh, that's fair. Or at least hide it from the boss. Don't do that. Keep open lines of communication with your boss. It's just the better way to go. <laughs> All right, so we are, what, bottom of the third? Yeah. So the speedrun record for this particular game is 23 minutes to win the game. Yeah, it's not there. I, 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 uh, the, oh, the opponent that kept hitting. That, them? that oh. was me, but it's not out. The opponent kept hitting foul balls. Mm. So I bet the people that won the speed run on this learned how to minimize foul balls. Yep, get them to hit every time. Or they ran it repeatedly until that's what they had happen. <laughs> that's the glory of speed running video games. Man. All right, so we are caught up on questions. Again, if anyone has questions, anyone just joining us, we are Ask a Scientist Gaming. Typically, it's mediocre gameplay, expert level science. Tonight, we're doing something special. We're answering questions about graduate school admission. Tis the season to be applying for graduate school if you have a bachelor's degree or will have a bachelor's degree in the sciences. Maybe graduate school is for you. If that is the case, throw your questions in chat. What do you want to know about the admissions process, about the graduate school experience, about applying, about anything you may want to know? Throw your questions in chat. And there are a lot of people in here that have gone to grad school or have PhDs beyond me and Justin that are happy to uh, provide answers and advice. So throw your questions in chat now. If not, Justin had one he wanted me to ask. What movie or TV show gets your discipline correct? <laughs> you remember your answer? I do. The the uh, the Nick, right? Uh, no, no, no. You said it was the Squid Game. <laughs> his, his new answer is Squid Game. <laughs> yes. Anyone hasn't seen it? It's on Netflix. <laughs> that gets something right. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, that, that that's all the rage i actually saw a news story today about them talking i think netflix was announcing that this is almost the most popular show they've ever had yeah. um which is is, is quite fascinating I, I saw another story that so for those of you not familiar this is a korean tv show it's episodic it's like 10 episodes an hour each or something like that i don't know how many there are total but um it's a really interesting storyline interesting storytelling like it's compelling the characters like there's love-hate relationships with them but I'm only two episodes in. I was told uh, the Korean Hunger Games, and that was it. That's all I had to hear. <laughs> that's what I was told. That's, that's how they described it on like uh, whatever whatever yeah. uh, Vanessa was watching. So Korean Hunger Games, I'm like, no, they said Korean Hunger Games, but a lot more violent. I'm like, oh, let's watch it. <laughs> Korean Hunger Games, and Hunger Games was partially based on Battle Royale, which is a Japanese. <laughs> yeah, so we it's all just circle. everyone stealing everything at this point. <laughs> but it's a fun show. I like it. Uh, one thing that was brought up, or I saw in a news story, so I'm I'm I've been watching it with dubbing on, but apparently the dub doesn't do justice to the actual original Korean subtitles or like the English subtitles of the Korean uh, language. But I can't attest to any of that. <laughs> hey Rob, I can't wait for everybody to be the soldiers on Halloween. Good point. <laughs> That's, it's going to be the uh, that will be the, so the, the, popular. The 2021 Harley Quinn will be the the Squid Game soldiers. Yeah. All right, I'm going to bean this guy. <laughs> Just rage induced. <laughs> ah, I need a I need wow. a left-handed I need a left-handed batter. That was an amazing change up. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Squid Game. 
<laughs> so let's reframe that question. Squid Game is not the answer. Is there a movie about college that gets the experience right? In particular, grad school and science. Mm. You know, that's a real... That's a good question. Um, a movie about grad school that gets it right with regards to science. Yep. <laughs> 68 mile per hour bean. <laughs> <laughs> uh, man. I, I'm really stretching here. That's a great question. You'd like to think that there's at least one, but I'm not... Yeah. I'm drawing a blank right now. I, why do I keep thinking of... I keep thinking of x -Men. Like I Professor mean, X's School of the Gifted. I'm not going to accept that answer. <laughs> Some aspects. Yeah. I mean, what? how many movies related to college? Good Will yeah. Hunting. Good Will Hunting, that's true. But not in grad school, though. He's not in grad school. Yeah, but I mean, the other people, like the people you come across, like the pretentious twats and the, you know, <laughs> like... Those are accurate, yeah. right? And then yeah. the, 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 the soft-spoken, brilliant people. Like, you quickly learn who... Usually it's not the loudest person in the cohort that's going to be the, the one that you really want to, like, befriend and, like, want to know. It's going to be the right. quiet reserve person. But yeah, <laughs> Good Will Hunting has aspects of that. Revenge of the Nerds. There you go. The college-based PCU. stories. PCU. PCU. <laughs> Van Wilder. Holy shit. Here we go. Down the rabbit hole. The one I would say for um, science-related experience is uh, Real Genius. And this is a conversation Rachel Yohe. She's an astrophysicist that I have. Have you ever seen Real Genius? Uh, I have, but it has been so long that I couldn't tell you anything about the movie at this point. I mean, I think that's your homework this time. Okay. So last time you watched... The Star, uh, Star Trek, Trek. Four. yeah, about and the Gattaca. Did you watch Gattaca? No, that wasn't the one. It was something else. The Island. The Island. I did watch <laughs> the Island. Yes, <laughs> so this that was good. Is, yeah, <laughs> three Stooges go to college. That's true. <laughs> Based on my research group. No, I'm just kidding. Sorry, Alex. <laughs> uh, what other college? Oh, you gotta things? be kidding me. That's, so we are. Home. How many innings in are we? Ooh. And they scored. That guy was fast. That was close. We are at the top of the fifth. Top so of the fifth. We're over halfway there. So I'm looking, you know, not too bad here. How many home runs do you have? Zero. <laughs> I almost have zero hits at this point. Oof. I don't know what this pitcher is doing, or maybe I'm just swinging real bad. Luck of the draw. Sinker. All right, let's throw a prediction in. I think we're due. In fact, it's almost 10 o'clock. Time has flown. Wow, is it really almost oh, 10? no, I can't predict yet because you're still playing baseball. Yeah, it's almost 10 o'clock. Oh, because you have to mm -hmm. enter in the outcome. Ah. Yep. <laughs> Unless you want me to guess. <laughs> <laughs> As of right now, uh, it's not looking too good. Uh, College-based movies. I'll have to think about that more. All right, again, anyone Ooh. just joining us, Ask a Scientist Gaming, Mediocre Gameplay, Expert Level Science. Today we're talking admissions, we're talking applications, we're talking about graduate school experience with the admissions chair of FSU Department of Chemistry and Biochemistry, Dr. Justin Kenimore. Um, if you have questions, please throw them in chat. We are happy to answer them. Even if it's something we've discussed before, we are happy to revisit any of those. Really, the goal here is just demystify the process, add transparency to what actually happens in admissions. Um, from both your end and our end, and then try to give you insights into it that hopefully help you apply for graduate school. Uh, speaking of which, if you're looking for graduate school program, there is a link in chat to FSU Chemistry. So apply to our program. One thing to note is there is, I think it's a $35 application fee, if I'm not mistaken, but if you get admitted and actually visit FSU, you get that reimbursed. Um, that application fee is not imposed by us. It's actually by the university and their processing system, but we can reimburse it through you taking a survey when you visit our department. That was close. That was nice. Should have went to second first and then to first, but whatever. <laughs> You're so dejected already. <laughs> There's plenty of time, Justin. You can make a comeback. They, they believe in you. Oh, more, more no. They believe in you than don't. That sound, that's embedded in my brain. I play basses loaded too, but it's the exact same sound. 
believe. Thank you, A-Rob. So, so I'll ask you a question. What, sure. What was your your highest high and lowest low of graduate school? I'm gonna go to the bathroom. I'll be back. Okay. Um. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think I think most students might rank passing the candidacy exam as a high point of grad school. Uh, it is a climactic event, um, and you work pretty hard to get through it. Uh, to to study and you know just do your best uh, so you know I, I think naturally that becomes one of the better highs uh, the, the final defense is um, great also but it's a little bit anticlimactic compared to the candidacy exam because your final defense you sort of kind of have a picture of whether or not you've got your your thesis done and it's it's enough and and your advisor sort of gives you a green light that you know you've you, you've completed enough work for a thesis so um it feels good nevertheless but i think the candidacy exam because there's still a little bit of uncertainty there uh is, is just naturally the high um low yeah again i would say that there's times in your first semester or in your first year that there's a bit of an imposter syndrome uh, with certain things. Um, uh, for example, I, again, I worked in industry for several years before I went into, uh, man, I suck, uh, I, before I went into grad school. So if you think about it, I was about seven years removed from when I took organic chemistry as an undergrad. That's a long time to have uh, not visited uh, undergraduate level organic chemistry and then you get into grad school and you're supposed to take an advanced organic course that builds off of the idea that you remember everything about undergraduate level organic chemistry and so immediately I felt a bit overwhelmed with that regard um, but uh, I would say that, that you know a healthy por portion of graduate students feel that way also. Uh, I think that the difference is whether or not it bothers you to the point where you put in the extra effort to go back and really try to hone in and, and relearn some of that stuff that you had at one point known and, and learned. Um, but it, it's it's you, you feel like you're you're not as good enough because you you're not as well calibrated with it so you, you you naturally feel a little bit low on yourself and it's more work for you and um so that so that can be a little bit trying but um again you know the the students that are going to find uh the best experience from grad school are the ones that uh, don't shy away from their their issues and, and deal with it head on and 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 just dive in to whatever needs to be done to 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 succeed so uh, I think that answered the question. That was your low? That was the low. And the high was passing the candidacy. I said, the thesis defense is anticlimactic. You sort of know, right? Yeah. So passing candidacy is, is, a, is, is a reason to party, right? It's a, it's a high. It's, it's a, a validation moment. Yeah. yeah. No, that's definitely true. <laughs> username taken. Excellent name. 8314. Because username taken 8313 was already taken. <laughs> All right. Uh, but on a serious note, how do you guys deal with imposter syndrome? So those of you not familiar, imposter syndrome is basically this, uh, this self-reflection moment where you're like, I'm not as smart as people think I am. I don't belong here. I, I don't have the skills or the qualifications to be in this environment. And it happens to most people. In fact, the people it doesn't happen to are probably the ones you should be most nervous yeah. about working with. So yeah. it's a good and a bad thing. That That is exactly right. The best way to deal with imposter syndrome is to realize that the best students feel that way. Um, and, and because it's not a, just students, like we feel that. Yeah, you know, we, <laughs> they're we, still going to figure that it out. Way. I shouldn't have a job. Uh, it is a natural feeling that someone will have if they're genuinely invested and they care about succeeding and doing well. Uh, so self-reflective yeah. and look at you know pros and cons of your own knowledge set. Like it's gonna happen. Oh, oh, oh. He, he pinned me to where I couldn't oh. go back. I had started the slide. Yep. That's brutal right there. <laughs> Wear Groucho Marx glasses. That is not the answer. 
I, I, th I think the big thing is, and I'm sure there's like books on psychology that deal with this much better than we ever would, but nice. I mean, understanding that every, like a lot of people feel that way. And it's, it's one of those Facebook phenomena where you don't necessarily see the negative parts of people's lives, but it is very, very common. I mean, I, I would say 90% of my graduate students have felt that. Maybe not expressed it like verbally, but subconsciously you can see it so um i think the best thing to acknowledge is that it happens to a lot of people oh look at that no i yeah, could not avoid yeah, it yep it was forced out i don't even that's know why they let you run backwards that's tie game right no nope, down long. by one yeah imposter syndrome that is very real like i still have days where i wake up i'm like i shouldn't be doing this i can't <laughs> like I don't belong here. There's this, this, and this person doing things much better than I can. Yeah, very, very real. And honestly, if, if things get bad enough, I, I don't hesitate to try to see a psychologist. Like, there are support systems at academic institutions that can help you with that. If it gets bad enough, it gets debilitating, it gets like you can't wake up and work in the morning, you gotta do something to change. This guy can totally bean this guy. Watch this. Watch this curveball. <laughs> You're speed running this game. Why did he swing at that? I threw it, it behind his back and he swung at it. <laughs> We're 25 minutes in. Wow. No, oh, you're, you're trying to win, Justin. What are you doing? <laughs> Sorry. There you go. How's the that? Strategy the strategy worked. The strategy worked. I'm you just intimidated. I was little, backing him out of the music. box. A little bit of chin music. There you go. 91 <laughs> mile per hour. Gotcha. Ladies and gentlemen, you were watching a crash course. Bases loaded, pitching intimidation. <laughs> Aim for the head on the first pitch. Nice. <laughs> oh, man. Username taken. Excellent name. The irony is not lost on us. Ooh, that was a wicked googly. All right, so Justin, you'll be happy to know I looked up the records. All right, so the record for winning a game of bases loaded is 23 minutes. Third place is 25.56. The record for losing a game of bases loaded, the record is 25.38. The slowest time is 30 minutes and 34 seconds. Slowest time? Yep. Okay. Well, there's only three people on the board, so... I was going to say, I'm pretty sure that someone that took 70 minutes didn't post it. <laughs> <laughs> A -Rob. Did not admit to it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, A Rob may be bitter about his bet on you getting more than one home run or more than two. He's like, good old Justin Goose Egg Kenimer. <laughs> He's reliable. We'll give him that. Justin hey. needs to do Ask a Scientist Gaming like 30 more times. I don't know. He's going to win this bet. I don't know what's going on, but I remember it being a lot easier to hit home runs than, than this. Uh, so. But they haven't substituted in their pitcher yet, so this guy's getting tired, and they actually do factor that in in this game. Your oh, pitcher yeah. will get worse. Oh, look at that, chasing it. That's a double. <laughs> so we're getting into the top of the lineup here. Let's do it. Mm -hmm. It could be one of those things. You never know. The believers, don't let them down. Well, we're good base hit. I'll take the base hits. This is an important question by Cuddle Puppy. Does this game have dugout clearing brawls? I don't think this one does. Does it have oh. bites? It. You know, that's a really good question. <laughs> Faithful Fairy. I don't know baseball at all. Are we winning? It depends if you bet for or against Justin getting more than two home runs. We're tied. <laughs> we're tied. <laughs> oh, that's too far. Oh, ho, ho, ho. Nice. Oh, I should have went. He threw it third. All right. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so Justin and I are going to have a good time playing NES and being drunk. But if you guys have questions, <laughs> feel free to throw them in chat. I'll throw predictions up there after this one's done. Come on, Patty. Oh, get it in there. Get some, baby. <laughs> it's my left hander. A lot of really good questions. Like these are existential questions, Ooh, not just like logistics ones that, for the most part, you can look up somewhere, but like. 
really reflecting on the graduate experience. Like, I really appreciate the thoughtfulness behind this. Mm -hmm. And if you're asking these questions, chances are you are the right person to, when you're struggling in grad school, you're going to be okay. Because you're, like, aware of what's going on. Oof. Uh -oh. How did he get over uh -oh. there so fast? No, you're good. That was the best hit so far, as far as velocity. Yeah. We got Baker. Just a little bit Here's farther. Here's my cleanup. Come on, baby. I'm in. It's good for the score. Not for the home run count. Yeah. I might win. <laughs> good old goose egg, Justin Ketterberg. <laughs> <laughs> but feel... If we're talking about home runs, yes. But I do have three runs. Do you, do you feel imposter syndrome right now? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Next time we're putting greater than less than 0. 0.5. <laughs> Just one home run. Uh, oh, no. Slide. Nobody comes out of grad school unscathed. That is... Pretty much true. I mean, there are some people that can coast through in the right group on the right project without having the trials and tribulations, but that is such a rarity. I mean, for the most part. Oh, they're putting in a pinch hitter. Was it runs or home runs? The answer is home runs. Number of home runs by Justin in game one. Implying there will be yeah. a game two and there will not be. <laughs> <laughs> Running out of time. Hey, Rob regrets his bet. That's how you strike out a pinch hitter. It'll turn your hairs gray, yes, as you can see from Ken's head. Yeah, you have no idea what color my hair is. Yeah. At some point, I'm going to have to cut mine, because it's 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 on the retreat. <laughs> it's inevitable. It'll make green screening much easier. I got news for you, Ken. I think uh, I want to take the new last place position. Yeah. I mean, we can post it. I can yeah, cut this together it. and say, I mean, Dr. at least we'll have a record of like where I'm Fourth to improve. Place. I mean, you'll be the third Ask a Scientist guest to have a speed run score of some kind. Yeah, I, I so ain't we'll, shy. We'll slowly accumulate our rankings. That's how you do three up, three down right there. <laughs> That's how you gain some time back. Come on, QC. Let's go, baby. <laughs> you can tell Justin has played much of bases loaded. Uh, oh, what? Awful. Oh. For the fences. <laughs> yeah, exactly. This isn't about winning. This is about home runs. Priorities, Justin. Priorities. Bony. Bony Maroney. Uh, I think what they do in the speed run, honestly, is to like score early and then... Oh, not far enough. They score oh. early and then they just like intentionally get out very quickly. Just to time speed run right so elkin will get you a home run every once in a while even though he's at the bottom of the lineup i remember elkin being kind of a savior in a couple of games <laughs> press f to inject roids <laughs> oh like this right here this look, is look not mid 90s <laughs> oh, go ahead elkin this is what i'm talking about oh, this is some. in the park home get run some. get some well done sir <laughs> Press F to inject roids. <laughs> this game's so unrealistic. <laughs> Are there any Barry Bonds cheat codes? <laughs> you have to cheat with Barry Bonds and Mark McGuire at the same time? Yes. Wow, did he try to pick you up? He did. Look at that. All right. Um, I got the lead and put in a pinch hitter for my pitcher. Who we got here? Five home runs, zero, ten here, here's home runs. Here's your moment, believers. Here it comes. Adjusting Zero home, home runs. Home run. Man, these are awful pinch hitters. All right, you got to go with Baum. <laughs> you bum. I don't know who any of these people are. Are these real names? I don't know. Probably not. No, not real names. Not yeah, like no. professional. Actual players. So before MLB Players Association. Ooh, whiff. Not a good start for Baum. <laughs> Baseball has been very good to me. Sosa, I agree. But oh, you got him panicking. Hot boxed. Oh, no. no, what? It... Damn it! Stressful. Oh, <laughs> he what a doofus! <laughs> that's, like... the, that's the hard part of the game is that you got to prevent him from getting close enough to where he auto slides. Yeah, it's you a got... real skill set. <laughs> Uh, I like it. 
Oh, that Rat. one's got some. No. No. You know, the stinky thing is, is that I got a lead, and so I either let them tie or go ahead, or I don't get another chance to uh, hit. Oh, no. This is it. Rage indeed. Thank you, Alex. <laughs> All right. Questions. Somebody has them. Throw your questions in chat or discussion points regarding grad school. Unique experiences. Um, anything you want to talk about, because grad school is a very unique life experience. That's for sure. I wouldn't trade it for anything, but also I don't know if I'd want to go back. <laughs> like where I am now, but... It's an investment uh, in yourself, yeah. which makes it rewarding and difficult at times. And so, you know, looking back on that investment that we made in ourselves, we wouldn't want to do it again because we liked getting through the other side of that investment and becoming what we became. Yeah. Um, but at the same time, you know, you... You make some good friends in grad school. That's true. Um, some of them will continue to be a part of your life uh, after grad school because you're all kind of working in the same business. You might see them at conferences. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, it's. Ooh, would you prefer to redo grad or undergrad? Excellent existential question. Was that the game? That's game. game Winner. Over. Was it the timer? 35 32 that's not bad considering you weren't actually trying any like speed run strategies i uh yeah i'll i'll, I'll take that compliment <laughs> compl assault <laughs> all right it, it is important to win the game because you shave half the half an inning off nah, that's a good point so losing a game actually the time is more impressive all right what do you want to do so we have 10 15 teenage mutant ninja turtles yeah, we can we can just like remind the audience of this ultra classic. Um, we have a whole lot of cheat codes in, so good. This should be fun. So, if you guys have never played Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, you got four mutant turtles. They each have a different weapon, and that's kind of like really one of the most underlying thing of this game is that you would you want to use a different turtle at different times because their weapon is either faster or reaches further or something in the middle uh and and so uh that was so you can see donatello's staff has a long reach right but it's slow but it's slow and the yeah. psi Raphael's psi i think is the fastest. that's right yep michelangelo is the generally the best all-around player because he's got medium range and whippy whippy uh, nunchucks right so all right, so you're starting with Michelangelo. Yeah, tip. Well, I think. Thanks. Do you start? Press start. Maybe you have to go in. All right, press. Yeah, there you go. This is kind of fun. So you don't have lives in the game, the game, but you do have four different turtles to select for. So when one of them dies, you can pick the other ones and continue right. playing. Um, note that we do have a whole lot of game genie codes in, so he will not be taking damage against any normal bad guys. Justin will be running this game basically invincible but it is still a non-trivial game uh, it's one of the hardest ones in nintendo so he can still lose this despite out not taking damage which is kind of crazy but anyway so cuddle puppy wants to know would you prefer to redo grad or undergrad uh would i still be young <laughs> so we'll uh, is the question like as a 40 year old would I, would I like to go back and do redo grad or undergrad <laughs> no i think it's like uh, if you could time capsule and back into it uh i mean gosh i i i had a lot of fun in undergrad uh um you know and grad was more um you know moving out of college and towards a career so you know, and that's that's the difference. They're, they're, they're hard to compare to one another because um, one was sort of a, the college experience, as you would think about it, uh, the undergrad. And then graduate school, you know, I, I felt like it had to be taken, go up. Yep. I think you want to go out to that next hole. Yep. There you go. Um, graduate school just naturally had to be taken more seriously. And, and, and um, but again, it, for what I do now in my adult life and, and the skills that I had got in grad school were a lot more rewarding than the skills that I got as an undergraduate. Um, oh, what is this, Bebop or Rocksteady? I don't remember. Bebop that. is the pig. The pig. The warthog. 
Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Texas Space Agency. Yes, I'm sure you all know turtles were named after famous pa painters. There is Michelangelo, Donatello, Raphael, and Giorgio O'Keefe. <laughs> <laughs> On point, Texas. Thank you. <laughs> uh, man, so so every uh, Thanksgiving, my my family tradition, and it's been uh, what ten years of this now. We watch some kind of movie marathon during uh, Thanksgiving. <clears throat> And so last year, because we had the daughters, like, you have to change your movie marathons. Like, okay. it used to be, like, Jaws and Jurassic Park and all sorts of stuff, like Alien and Predator. Uh, but now we had to mix it up. So last year we did Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Because there's a couple cartoons, but then there's a couple live-action movies. So it was really fun to see my, you know, five-year-old, well, four at the time, oh, starting to reflect on what are their names? What is the blue one? That's the leader. <laughs> what is the orange one? He's the, 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 the crazy one. What is the red one? He's the angsty one. <laughs> and she, like, recognized their character traits, which is kind of amazing. And Georgia O'Keefe was the solemn one. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Texas. So, the Ninja Turtles. Um, I have these actually in my in my possession. Oh yeah, your your collection. In, in my in my comic collection. Yeah. Uh, they actually started off a lot more graphic and a lot more dark than your kind of cowabunga, you know, yeah, Ninja yeah. Turtles that that the cartoons uh, reflected. And so I have a couple of like graphic novels. Uh, just what I would call like a large comic book. I don't know why I'm in here. There's nothing here um, That you know they, they they reflect a little bit more of a uh, Of a darker side to the backstory of the Ninja Turtles, right? So there's a really fun I don't remember which which Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle movie is but it's one of the cartoons and basically they do this multiverse theme where they combine the cartoon ones with the original comic ones like you see the different stylizations of them hmm. and it was really satisfying to see cuz like it was the the seriousness of the original comic which was much more violent and aggressive than the cartoon Yeah right and they they like captured that in this movie so I, I learned about that through this Thanksgiving marathon. So, yeah, kind of fun. <laughs> no, we're expanding to uh, uh, the crazy turtle is named Dolly. The hairy turtle is Frida. <laughs> the one you're not really sure he's a turtle is Jackson Pollock. <laughs> <laughs> to be fair, my favorite painter by far is George W. Bush. It's not, uh, who is it, Gacy? Uh, Wayne Gacy, John the, uh, Wayne Gacy. The, the, the the serial killer that painted yeah. clowns. <laughs> Pick and choose your battles. <laughs> Although, wasn't there a character in Ninja Turtles that was... Uh, I thought it like his name was similar to John Wayne Gacy. Oh, Casey Jones. Casey Jones, there we Casey go. Casey Jones, he is not in this game as far as I know. He was introduced much, much later. <laughs> your favorite painter is George W. Bush. Yes, Casey Jones. Classic. We're dating ourselves. We are so old. That's right. Uh, but they, no, they have new Turtles cartoons. We can't feel too bad. All right, ladies and gentlemen, anyone just joining us? We're doing, uh, oh, we have an actual science question. Go, oh. Crolax, welcome to the stream. Thank you for throwing a question in chat. The question is, I'm having trouble deciding whether to pursue organic chemistry in grad school or a more biochemistry related degree um, and to pursue that biotech. Did you guys struggle with what, what you wanted to post or uh, pursue post bachelors as well? Um, a little bit, right? Um, I mean, even within this, even within like a selected program area, of just let's just say just straight up organic chemistry right i mean there's a lot of flavors within just that right so there's there's definitely um again some pressure i think uh to to find the 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 right one and there might not be any solution to like how you do find the right one i think that a lot of people might look back and say hey i i kind of just picked something and and now i really love it just I worked hard at it. I'm really good at it now. I'm recognized for it, and as a result, this is my jam. Um, so, uh, I guess maybe to answer your question on on specifically those two areas, it would be sort of like what approach do you want to take to the problem that you want to solve, right? So, 
um, for example, organic chemistry, you might be employed to potentially uh, synthesize a molecule that would then be in some way tested for a therapeutic type of uh, activity. And then in biotech, you might be doing a little bit more hands-on with maybe uh, maybe biorobotics or or um, uh, more engineering principles rather than chemistry, right? So I think that's maybe kind of the, where you want to ask yourself, what, what do I want my hands to be kind of doing on a day-to-day -day basis? Synthesis versus maybe engineering, testing, analysis, programming, robotics type of stuff. No, I think that's awesome advice. So one of the things I tell students, uh, my undergrads or the graduate students picking groups is I say, you want four things to really enjoy life, right? You want to enjoy who you work for. You want to enjoy who you work with. You want to enjoy the goals of your project as well as the day-to-day -day basis things. And so the first two are personnel related. The latter two are like topical, what you're talking about. And so I think it's really worth reflecting on, you know, if you want to cure cancer but you don't want to do gel electrophoresis you're going to hate your life right so there's there's a mixture of the goals of your project and the long-term goals of your research but also day-to-day -day things and so this is why i think the 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 like rotations aspect of classes if you weren't here earlier basically most programs have some sort of rotation phase where you spend time with each professor and each research group that is really really important to figure out what you actually want to do on a daily basis and so I think I think the rotations will probably answer that question for you. And so yeah, that's that's uh, that's again the general advice I give, and it's it will really depend on your experience. You know, I vividly remember this jump right here that I'm that I just missed. I remember it. Oh, it's a you, pain in the bum. Do you want to know the worst part about it? This is, this is a rage-inducing jump, and the reason is it's not a jump at all. You can walk across the gap. No way. I shit you not. <laughs> There's an entire angry video game nerd episode about this particular. <laughs> it's ridiculous. I'm allowed to do uh, this, and then I'm going to rage quit. <laughs> I wonder about that as well. Then I've seen people come... Uh, came for a faculty and later, uh, so this, this is related to a question that uh, Texas Space Agency asked, which is, how do you feel about the advice, don't pick a program, pick a faculty? You lied to me. I oh, no, this one, you, oh, sorry, this isn't the one I was thinking about. This is the, there's another one after this. Sorry, wow. I wasn't paying attention to it. Sorry about the rage moment. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I remember that AVGN episode. Yes, it's excellent. So, some are hit or miss, but the Turtles one is, is superb. So yeah, I think you have to wait till you're like off the edge to actually jump. Like practice it on this one. Yeah, I like that. So it's like the hitbox is just at the tail end. Anyway, how do you feel? Should I wait till after your jump to? Uh, Go ahead. How do you feel about the, the advice? Don't pick a program, pick a faculty. Uh, I like that advice. I do. I mean, as long as that faculty isn't doing research in an area that you very much dislike, yeah, yeah. Uh, I think it needs to start there. I say, identify what you really don't like or see yourself wanting to do for grad school. Start there. All right. Now you've got kind of, maybe you've got one third to one half of your options sort of chiseled away. Well, now you got a whole nother half of options that are, let's just say, in some ways, equally enticing. And you're not an expert in any of them. There it is. Uh, so then you might look at other factors that would be involved on making the ultimate decision. The advisor, the research group, um, I don't know. Uh, the advisor, the research group, you definitely want to talk to the advisors about or talk to the students in the group about, you know, does, do they get to go to conferences? Um, you know, how's the group structured? Uh, what does interaction with the boss look like? So some people thrive in an environment where um, the, if the advisor is more of a micromanager, uh, they, they thrive in that environment a little bit more. Some people thrive in an environment where they have self-sufficient uh, motivation and uh, and they just kind of like leave me alone I'm gonna get work done and I'll be back and I'll we'll meet every once in a while that type of thing 
so there's a lot of, you know, PIs have personality, you have a personality, and uh, you, if you, if you know what type of people you mesh with, that, that might help to uh, to help make a decision in that regard. Um, but ultimately, you're going to be working in the in the trenches with your research group. So, uh, your advisor you might see periodically, um, and he has a lot of, or he or she has a lot of say over uh, certain things of your day-to-day -day basis. But uh, you know, the people in your research lab are the ones that you that you spend the majority of time with. Yeah, the, the I, I think some of the comments harken to this. I wonder that as well. I've seen people come for a specific faculty and later most people were also interested, so she didn't make the cut. And so one piece of advice I give to everyone is um, try to have at least two faculty you're interested in. And so for whatever reason, if your top choice cannot take students or isn't taking students or has 15 people interested and is only taking three, you want to have a backup plan. And so for any school you apply to, make sure there's at least two people you think you'd be interested in working for. I do not remember how to get through this. I think I do. Oh, you're going back to start. Well, I know I got that one already, but I remember there was a fork in the road up here that I... Nope, just kidding. Hi, right. Hey, you got a minute. <laughs> Michelangelo is about to bite it. Can you switch now? Which turtle do you want oh, to yeah. die? Uh, you got to get rid of Raph. <laughs> That's unfortunate. Harsh. But he's uh, he, his short range weapons is not nearly as as valuable as. But anyway, back to that discussion. Yes, I like if if you can find a couple people you're willing to work for, even if there's someone you have your heart set on, there's just no guarantee. For all you know, they're going to switch departments before you arrive. Like there's there's things out of your control that you need to account for. Um, No data back this up. Yeah, the, there's a lot of horror stories about wanting to go somewhere. This was the worst when you didn't have game genie codes. Like right. by far the part hardest part of this game. Uh, note that there's certain seaweed that'll actually kill you despite the game genie code. So heads up on that. Good to know. That that type of seaweed will kill you. All right. Feel the stress of this coming back. Yeah, I do. Because you'd rent this game and lose every time right. at this particular section. Um, now that I know I can just blast through the bolts, I'm just going to... Yeah, it. you only have to worry about... Oh, you start back at here? What? Brutal. I didn't know that. If time runs out, you have to start back further. That I think is I remember insane. that now. This game was infuriating at times. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Oh no, we choose our outcome on the baseball game. How many home runs did Justin hit? Less than 1.5. <laughs> All right, congratulations. Less everyone. than one. <laughs> Equal to zero. All right. Uh, but I did win, is... so progress. Let's do a fun, just this is a factoid again, near on the uh, Ask a Scientist Gaming Honor Code system. Wow, we, we timed out on our prediction. So oh, no it way. It didn't even go to completion. No, I don't know. It's not letting me actually predict it. Wow. I'm sorry, whoever guessed less than 1.5, you lost out on your standard internet units because it took too long to get to an answer. I didn't know that was an issue. All right, we're going to throw another prediction up there because we got some standard internet units to spend, and Justin spent time writing these questions. Uh, so <laughs> let's, let's throw these up there now. Hey, Rob saved his points because you took too long to lose your bet. <laughs> <laughs> Worth it. All right. Uh, amazing. All right. So the question we're going to throw up right now, predictions, standard internet units, spend them. If you're not following, click the follow button. You'll get your 300 standard internet units you can bet right now. The question is, how many total chemistry PhDs were granted in 2015? Oh. The reason I use 2015 here is because that's the last time we saw that statistic. But the question is, is it greater than 3,000 or less than 3,000. This is PhDs granted in the United States. This is not globally. This is just specific to the U.S. because that's the stat I had in front of me. What you mean I got my points? Did you? Did it actually go through? Because it, it, it was giving me an error on this. So hopefully you guys got your points if you deserve them. So yeah, less than 1.5. But throw your prediction in there right now in terms of the total chemistry PhDs granted in 2015 in the United States. Is the answer greater than 3,000 or less than 3,000? And that's that's an interesting. So FSU, we grew, we graduate what? Probably twenty five to thirty per year. 
<laughs> Total we'll see, PhDs 30, less than 30, 1.5. 30 research faculty, one per year might be a little bit much. So yeah, I'd say about maybe the 25 per year. Bitch. <laughs> You're right. <laughs> just, just sick of getting wrecked by great games. Yeah. Uh, but you don't take damage, so you might as well commit. All right, total chemistry PhDs granted. You guys have about 35 seconds. Oh, you, 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 wow. I read the NSF's doctorate granted survey each year. I mean, it is enthralling reading. <laughs> the PhD did it. <laughs> All right, the question is total chemistry PhDs granted in 2015. Spend your internet units now. We need answers. Is it greater than 3,000 or less than 3,005? Four, three, two, one. All right, Justin, do you remember the answer to this? I don't, actually. I, I kind of uh, verified and then just... Wow. So we have a 99 to 1, 99% say greater than 3,000. This is in terms of betting amounts. Uh, turns out the answer is actually 2,600 PhDs in chemistry every year. So okay. less than 3,000 took the win. That was a 70 to 1 payout. Wow. Oh, nice. Congratulations to who do we have winning these points. Cheap scientist, <laughs> congratulations. Taking your your uh, standard internet now, unit. Now, rich scientist. Yeah, yeah, no. Baller here. 70 to 1 out of, uh, what, 20 to 20 point? 40 standard internet unit bet. Congratulations. Was there any confirmation as to whether or not the uh, base is loaded, uh, timed out completely, or just auto awarded people? Did you guys um, get points for the base is loaded? Back. Maybe, than maybe they got their money back. I don't know how it works. Because it wouldn't let me choose an outcome, so I assume it didn't work. Oh, chief scientist selected. Take a drink. I gotta get another drink. Are you good? I'm really good, yeah. I've been slacking on this one. So I'll, I'll take another one and you Ugh. do it the proper way. Cheers. <laughs> Cheers, Chief Scientist. Congratulations Cheers. on your 70 to 1 payout. Man, that's pretty close. We had, what was it, 112 to 1 last time? 70 to 1 is pretty solid. How many take a drinks do I need to redeem for a chug? I thought about adding like a take a shot, but I don't want to commit my guests to that. <laughs> Texas Space Agency also redeemed take a drink. All right. And cheers. I mean, we can wait till I'll, you're done. I'll take a chug, not only for that, but since the audience requested it. <laughs> the answer is zero. Justin will chug any. <laughs> Are we a cuddle puppy? I always vote against consensus because of hot odds. I mean, that's that's worthwhile. I think Justin's the first one that had a 50 50. So you, I think you want to go left here. There's one over here, and then I got to come back. You got to go right. Yeah. Yep. Is there one over here? There is. It's right over the top left up here. Yep. I think your best bet is if time is running out, hit that the 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 seaweed that kills you. Yep. Then I think you get another try with different ah. turtles. Well, the good thing is that I'm not going down into the left, which is not the right way to go this time. <laughs> How many take a drinks do I need to redeem for a keg stand of Everclear? Oh man, I have like. 12 hours of meetings tomorrow, <laughs> which is my life. I don't know, Thursday and Friday just went to shit for me in terms of meetings. Yeah, I gotta teach at 8 a.m. <laughs> Did not know that. <laughs> yeah, that's like my only, my only, my only, uh, like... Uh, hesitancy. Hesitancy to do, to do this, but, uh, um... Right is one. Yeah, I think you're good, so go down now. Yeah. If that gets too low. Might want to kill yourself. I think we're all right. There's like, there's like one one over here, and A Rob has ten thousand points to spend. If you guys have ideas for things we can do for channel points, throw them our way. We'll gladly think about them. And then this is the hard stay part. Above that. This is the hard part. You gotta get. You gotta have to stay above these things. Yep. There it is. That's the last one. Look at that. I almost made it through it without even. A Rob has redeemed request a factoid. I actually brought some factoids. You have some. And you beat the level. Kudos, sir. I did. I, I wrote a couple down just for the heck of it. How about push-ups? Oh, that'd be interesting. I've actually started doing, like, little workouts in my office just to, like, kind of pseudo-stay in shape. 
Who requested a factoid? Um, A Rob did. A Rob. So we already covered that the GRE requirement has been waived this year, so that's um, a reminder of a factoid. <laughs> I want to buy them all. <laughs> uh, Dump knowledge in my brain, Sagan Deity. Did we cover what the actual stipend of a student was at FSU? No, what is an actual stipend? It is, is 24240 So you get paid $24,241 a year to get a PhD. True. <clears throat> I don't think there's a better gig than that. It's true. I mean, we're paying you to make more money. How does that work? You know, that, that's that's a that's a really good opportunity. And the only thing that you got to do is just kind of like really want it, yeah. right? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, so, oh yeah, I got the mobile. All right, and... we are at 10:40. How long do you think it's going to take for you to beat Narc? The world record is nine minutes and 24 seconds. I'd say that because of the impossibleness of even getting into any level of depth in TMNT right now, let's just go ahead and go over to Narc. All right, ladies and gentlemen, it is time for the game closer of Ask a Scientist Gaming. It's time to play Narc. Another factoid is that the preferred deadline for applications is December 15th. The final deadline, the drop dead get <laughs> deadline is February 1st, but please try to get them in by December 15th if you're considering us. Um, yeah. <laughs> hey, hey, Rob keeps requesting factoids. <laughs> He's got 10,000 points. He's just burning them. <laughs> He's four Let's deep see. now. We have a departmental recommended requirement of a 3.1 GPA. You know, again, uh, you know, there's a holistic way of looking at applications. Oh, yeah. Here we go. We're to speed run this. Oh, snap. Are we? Yep. Factoid, we are going to speed run this. <laughs> hey, Sorry, I don't think I can keep up with all these factoid requests. <laughs> oh, man. Fun factoid. Uh, Twitch was hacked fairly recently, and the entire source code has been released online. Oh, no. Mm-hmm. So I was in panic mode earlier today. Those of you that follow us and get notifications, you might have noticed I had logged on earlier. It's because I cha had to change my password and my streaming key, as well as the password associated with everything from Nightbot to Streamlabs to all sorts of crap. So, fun factoid. Yeah. Twitch is now open source. <laughs> all right, we need to throw another prediction up there. You might actually fly through this because you watched the speedrun video. You actually saw the strategies associated with it. All right, we're going to throw another prediction up there. Get ready with your standard internet units. It is time. Uh, this one's kind of a fun one. It's a very specific factoid that people might know. Wait, I don't know about this. Oh, yeah, no, look it up. And if you have, if you're streaming and or have a lot of money associated with Twitch, you might want to change your password. Um, yeah, you change your change your password and change your stream key. And so, yeah, it's, it's, it's apparently all that information is available. They've also released like how much people earn and how much they get advertising dollars. It's a crazy leak. And this was today and yesterday. A Rob might have more details, but yeah, change your password ASAP and you might want to keep track in case they actually didn't close the loophole yet. All right. We're going to throw a prediction up there. God, that's crazy. The Bob Ross channel in the last three months made $222,000. There are streamers on Twitch that make something on the order of a million dollars a month. Bob Ross channel? Yeah, there's a Twitch stream that's just Bob Ross painting videos. I used to watch that all the time when I was younger. It's on Twitch 24 hours a day. You can watch it again. More than they made on PBS, probably. Oh, yeah. That might be true. I mean, it's probably... So you need to bullet these guys and not rocket them. Can you remind me again what the bullets are? Uh, it's hold A. Oh, that's right. And it's got to be the... You got to be close to the guys in black. Um, holding B is squat. Okay. All right, I'm going to throw a prediction up there right now. And this is kind of an interesting question. So... Uh, FSU makes offers to a certain number of graduate students, and a portion of those students, uh, any of the dom domestic students, are invited to visit FSU on our dollar. And when they visit FSU, they make a decision whether they want to come here or not. 
And so the question is, of the students that actually come and visit Florida State University Chemistry Department, what percent accept our offer? As in, we've admitted these students, we fly them out, they come and visit. Is it 25% or 50% of the students that visit that actually accept our offer? Now, I don't think there's any way you can know this, but it's kind of an interesting guess regardless. What am I looking for here? A key or something to drop? That's the black guys, and you have to shoot them within... Yeah, there you go. All right. I'm <laughs> waiting for hot odds. <laughs> you know, 112 to 1 payout. It's worth it. 71? Worth it. So the question is, of the students that actually visit FSU, so they take our tour, talk with our faculty, meet with our students, what percentage of them actually end up accepting our offer and join us at FSU? Again, there's no obvious way you should know this answer, but I'm, I'm curious where your stance is. Are you ready for the car? I am. <laughs> where do you take them for dinner when they visit? I don't know. It varies, right? It's pretty good restaurants. Yeah. I yeah, mean, yeah. I mean, the thing is, like, when I when I interviewed or when I visited, like, UCLA, they can take you to, like, Santa Monica Pier and have dinner over the pier and things like that. FSU, we don't have that, like... <laughs> there you go, Alex, Rob. That one was for you. Clip it. <laughs> the car blowing up. Hey, I made it past the dumpsters, which I've never done before. So there's that. Faithful Ferry. I felt like my department gets 20 kids each cohort. There's no way we invited 80 of them to visit. Making an educated guess here. Last five seconds. Yes, typically local restaurants, but it's nice restaurants. It's, it's where we take faculty when they visit. Like visiting professors for seminars, typically the same re yeah. restaurants. I think we took him to like uh, Cool Beans Cafe, which is a very popular joint. Uh, we went <laughs> to that so place. Denny's. Nah. <laughs> yeah, Waffle, <laughs> Waffle House. <laughs> we we'll real lucky. Southern classic. <laughs> Although I do like Waffle, Waffle House. I, I, I would never complain about someone saying, let's go to Waffle House. Are we talking $30 a plate places uh, with students? I don't know. A-Rob might be able to answer that. Lori might have a better answer as well. I think it's 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 reasonable restaurants. Like, we're not going to the top tier places, but Justin and I also don't go to the top tier places. Spirit, Masa, Andrews, Midtown, Caboose. Um, cool Beans is another restaurant locally. Yeah, cool Beans, yeah. Um, I think one of the take-homes here is apply to FSU Chemistry with that link right there. Get accepted and come visit us, come to dinner, and we'll uh, we'll figure out whether the food was worthwhile or not. All right, so percent of, percent of visiting admits that accept FSU's offer. Uh, heavily biased towards 50%. Do you know the outcome? I know this answer. If you don't, I got this one from Eugene, actually. I think it's a I think it's hot. It's a, a surprisingly high percent. Yep. So the answer is actually 50%. So 50% of the students that visit FSU Chemistry end up accepting our offer. Yeah. And so this is astounding because if you take any university, I mean, if you take a top 10 program, their rate is something like 10%. If you take a similar school uh, ranking as FSU, which is around 50% somewhere or 50 and somewhere in there, it's usually going to be less than 30%. But FSU, we get a very high return on investment. So students that visit our program typically make the decision to join us. And I think it's because, I mean, one, awesome faculty like our very own Justin Kennemore, but also our facilities, when you get to see that in person, our new buildings that like nice facilities, nice spacing, nice lab benches. Yeah, uh, faculty camaraderie, mm -hmm. I think that goes a long way. Collegiality matters, cause, uh, encourage collaborations within the department. I should have told you to drive down I know that's just a lot of real estate that I could have very fastly gone past. So I don't know if you uh, you heard this, but my brother is reverse engineering this game, and he wants to create a, a version where basically the car just bounces off the walls rather than exploding. Huh. <laughs> the hailstorm visitation. That's pretty brutal. On my second visit to FSU during my interview, I got food poisoning. I think it was from, I don't remember which restaurant it was, but like I was out playing ping pong with Mike, Sh Mike Shatruck and at some point I ended up throwing up in the bathroom. Still <laughs> accepting the offer. Cuddle puppy, Denny's. <laughs> what? It said Denny's. 
<laughs> Second time Denny's became relevant during this discussion. <laughs> uh, oh man, that is amazing. <laughs> mm. E. coli was invented at Denny's. I'm sure it's the cure for something. <laughs> at least something Ooh. at Denny's is. <laughs> Can't just run through these clowns. These clowns are brutal. Yeah, no, they're stabby clowns, not to be messed with. Oh, good lord. All right, it's so not a bad payout. 80%, yes, 50%. So, well, I guess it was three to two. Yeah, the clowns are no joke. If you go what down and jump away, you can get away from him. Oh, one time at an interview, and this might have been a test, my interviewer said, so, I don't mean to sound racist, but... Oof. Just go in? Yep, ducks. There's a white card at the end that you need. Yay, punchy guys. Crazy. I mean, I had some of those experiences. I interviewed at one place where one of the, the faculty I talked to was complaining about what the what one of their co-workers wear, wore to work. Like, they didn't like how casually that person dressed. I'm like, I don't necessarily belong here. <laughs> Cuddle puppy. I don't mean to sound racist, but Denny's is a pretty good restaurant. <laughs> I'm doing I'm doing this thing that I did the last time where I went up through this door and then went immediately up through no, that door no, again. You're good. <laughs> I feel like if I would have said, hell yeah, brother, yeah. Yee, I would have gotten the job. Oof. But do you want that job is the question. Do you actually want that job? Alright, we're gonna throw another prediction up there. So we got to burn them down before we run out of time. We got 10 minutes left, Justin. You have 10 minutes to beat this game. Um, prediction, this is actually a throwback. This is a question that if you watch Justin's previous stream, you will actually know the answer to. So we'll see who's been paying attention, who retained their knowledge over long-term memory. Uh, you have to bullet these guys to get a green card on them. But in proximity, not too far away. Did I just get blown up by a pot plant? Yes. There you go. The yes. So some of those pot plants have explosives. Heads up. I see. All right, so here's the question. Return guests might have the answer to this. The question is, before chemistry, Justin wanted to study architecture or law. What did younger Justin dream of being before he washed out and became a chemist? <laughs> Sell your soul to learn to play the blues. It's a history reference. That's fun. Architecture or law? We have one vote for architecture, but it's only 10 points, so not too confident. <laughs> hey, Rob, a baseball player. We know that's not true. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Under one point. I mean, I wanted to be, but yeah. reality set in eventually. Mm -hmm. <laughs> architecture, specifically low quality diner franchises. <laughs> I wanted to Cuddle own a Denny's is the theme. <laughs> <laughs> We need to find a Denny's-related game. Denny's store <laughs> owner. I think you're on pace to beat this before 11 o'clock. Architecture or law? We have one person saying law, one person saying architecture. Get your votes in now. If you're not following, click the follow button. Get your standard internet units that are pretty much useless, but fun to bet nonetheless. Alex Rob requested 55 factoids in the last hour through these standard internet units, so. Hey, where's Mr. Wormy at Worm? Oh, okay. Oh, I gotta go. You gotta go through three doors before you get uh, to right. us. He was like here at the end of this. <laughs> Have you ever heard of the Waffle House Index for Disaster Response? I don't think I've formally heard it described that way, but it basically says that if a Waffle House in your area closes, you should get the hell out because they don't close unless something extreme has happened. Is that, that about sum it up, uh, Texas Space Agency? <laughs> Is there a Mac and me game? <laughs> there should be if there isn't already. Paul Rude demands it. <laughs> Mac and me. Have you seen that movie? It's a really it? terrible 80s alien. Yeah. Like it was an E.T. ripoff. There's, right. there's a dance scene inside of a McDonald's. If I'm remembering correctly, someone can correct me if I'm wrong. 
back to me. The Waffle House Index. Like, percentage of Waffle Houses that close before you should leave. <laughs> Alex Rob did the math. It's impossible. In Georgia, it's impossible to be more than 11 miles away from a Waffle House. Can I just say something with regards to Denny's, though? Yeah. There is a Denny's on North Monroe, um, just below the I-10 line, that has... I I've never had a bad experience there. Yeah, it's good. Fresh, hot coffee. Take that, really, little puppy. Really good service. Uh, orders correct. Food's always hot. Uh, I mean, just exactly... Can't complain. <laughs> there he is. You got a missile his ass, right? Yes. So my major contribution to speedrunning this game, the, the reason I have the record in this, is because I figured out if you rocket him on the left side of the screen and then despawn him off the left, he does an inchworm. It saves you a certain amount of time if he doesn't do that inchworm thing. I can't even hit him with this thing. Yeah. Uh, just tap A. Tap, tap, tap. There you go. So there it is, ladies and gentlemen. If you haven't seen the Mac and Me wheelchair scene, it is linked in YouTube right now. <laughs> Stick around for the next six minutes and watch it afterwards. All right. <laughs> BBQ Jones. <laughs> Paul Rude loves that scene. Where'd he go? All right, so we're running short on time. We have six minutes. Who are we going to raid? Does anyone have suggestions as who we should go raid? Let's see if raid? anyone is up. Uh, so we can basically take us and our followers to another stream, basically saying our stream is over. And it's a way to build up their audience, but also increase our visibility, because um, usually they you know, acknowledge we exist after that. Oh. Nice. That's three. That's three. Here it comes. What was your record on this? Nine minutes and 24 seconds. So nine times two is just about 20, 20 minutes. Yeah. Well, I figure that's reasonable. If you get this in the next five minutes, and this boss is terrible, make no mistake. I've already forgot his secret. You gotta shoot his glasses off, right? So Rocket Sage is just chatting. She's a geologist. Sid Heresy does, um, uh, I think, electrical engineer. Texas, thank you for swinging by. Thank you for your commentary and comments and questions regarding admissions and applications to graduate school. We really appreciate your time. Um, Texas says, thank you for joining us, Justin. Oh, there you go. Nice. So now you just have to shoot him in the face. Texas said, who said thanks? Uh, Texas Space Agency. Ah, nice. One of our regulars. <laughs> not applying for graduate school in chemistry, but it's not too late to change careers, so. Um, I'm going to put a link right now in chat. Apply to FSU chemistry. Uh, rockets to the face. Oh. So if you go to the top of the screen, he can't hit you with whatever those things are. Um, lasers out of his tongue or eyes. You don't have to jump. Just shoot rockets. All right. Now it's shooting vertebrae with bullets. And I think you have to do it from the right side, but I'm not 100% sure on that. Wow, he really <laughs> likes to just get all up in your grill. We're 20th on science and technology on Twitch. Nice, moving up in the world. We're only like 20 spots behind ducks. <laughs> ducks and watching fish and... <laughs> oh, I may have woken up my daughter. I heard that. So this one's weird, so you don't want to squat and shoot. So you want to basically run to the right move up or down and shoot back and it has a really weird head box i don't know the rules associated with this yeah. and a stop sign a stop sign has how many viewers right now <laughs> oh i see it now when you see points you actually know you're doing it right yeah, yeah. so now you're down to four vertebrae you're gonna do this in sub 20. 
So I think I talked my brother and when he comes down for Thanksgiving, we're gonna try to speed run this two player. See how that goes. I wanna be the world record holder in both categories. So I'm not doing it right. This, this isn't your fault at all. This is really weird. So it, it, it matters where you are on the screen, but also where you, when you position yourself on the screen, which is really weird, but that's the rules associated with that. So I have to be at like the top or the... <laughs> stop sign cam has 50 viewers. Justin, you are worth less than a stop sign camera. <laughs> <laughs> I'll take it. <laughs> no, we, we enjoy our position in this universe. Dude, I, I, I'm running up and down and all around, and I'm not even getting like a single point here. So, so I would go all the way to the left, then come back to the right, and just like reposition, shoot left, reposition, shoot left, and just slowly do it. Should we raid the stop sign cam? Is that what you're saying, Alex? I see what you mean now. Yeah, what is that all about? So you can only shoot them from the right side. Yeah, no, it's it's a weird, weird hitbox. All right, time to close out with civil forfeiture of the lever level and then call it a game. Nice. So you can do this in under 20 minutes if you go quick. Move it. Uh. All right, we got Rocket Sage, the Geologist, Sid Harsay, the uh, Electrical Engineer slash, I don't know, Tinkerer with Electronics, Coder Snacks, a Programmer, Science Streams playing uh, Wingspan, uh, Bird-related things? I don't know what Wingspan is. Should we braid Science Streams? They only have two viewers right now. Who's up for Science Streams? You when do you stop the timer? Oh, I'd stop it when you open that door. I apologize. I completely screwed that up. That's all right. You can go back in the video and... Oh, is this ASS? Is that... <laughs> you remember... <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> all right, everyone. Thank you for swinging by Ask a Scientist Gaming. Uh, today was an interesting day. We talked about graduate admissions applications. So uh, it was really fun to have um, Ask a Scientist Gaming. <laughs> Can't rate ourselves. Anyway, it's, it's a pleasure to have everyone answering questions as well as our regular returners. It's always a pleasure to have uh, conversations and commentary and additional dialogue. Uh, Justin, thank you for joining me for a second time for Ask a Scientist Gaming. Yeah. Um, any parting words for the audience? No, it's, it's um, really great. Great questions, everybody. And, um, you know, as always, you might think of one once this has concluded. And, uh, you know, feel free to 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 shoot me an email or, or Ken. Or, or uh, if you think of something else that you're just curious about with regards to the grad school process, uh, we're here to help. And, yeah, thanks for uh, uh, believing that I was going to hit more than one and a half home runs, most of you. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes it pays off. All right, so in two weeks, we're going to have uh, actually a big data scientist, uh, someone in the statistician department that actually looks at, you know, st statistical validity of things like big data processing, machine learning, artificial intelligence. Um, so yeah, that should be some fun. Join us again in two weeks. And so we'll have uh, another science-based discussion. Um, until then, it's been a pleasure and we'll see you again next time.